uh, copy this link and post it to international ball Whose jersey is uh, whose jersey is number one? Uh, Mikey De Gregorio, ex player. We're live on YouTube now. I'm just gonna. Do I play the video? Uh, yeah, sure. Hashtag Bangon Filipinas. Blackwater would like to support our heroes of the front line who are risking their health and well-being to attend to COVID-19 patients. Mm -hmm. We aim to provide the frontliners of the Pasig City General Hospital hygiene kits which they can use daily. Blackwater, smell good, feel good. This webinar series is brought to you by Hoop Coaches International in cooperation with Blackwater. Smell good. Okay. This coaching webinar series would like to give special thanks to the following. Samahang Basketball ng Pilipinas Coaches Commission Head, Coach Jong Yochiko. Basketball Coaches of the Philippines President, Coach Louis Gonzalez. Cut Skills Head, Coach Alan Ricardo. And Frontliner, Christopher Top Juliano. Hello, good evening, and uh, welcome back to our uh, coaches. And we have a very special topic for tonight. And of course, um, none other than our resident sports psychologist uh, will uh, be joining us in, on his uh, uh, very special topic on uh, the important role of the uh, sport psychologist in a basketball team or in a team per se uh just um you know uh he's uh just a short backgrounder he met him when i was coaching um uh jru heavy bombers he was doing his uh, thesis at the time and uh, we went on uh developed a good relationship and he's uh, gone uh, with me in uh, tough battles uh, uh, off the court that has helped us on the court. And of course, to expound more on that, uh, our partner in this um, webinar series, uh, without further ado, Dr. Teddy Villasor. Good evening, Doc. Good evening, Coach Ariel. Good evening, everyone. Yes, we're also live on International Ball uh, Facebook page. So if uh, anyone would like... Uh, uh, to uh, ask questions on the International Ball Channel, you're free to do so. All right, Doc, go. Just read, uh, read the questions, read the questions uh, as they come, Coach. Can we start the presentation? Uh, no, I'd like to ask you more, oh, okay. uh, you know, first. I'd okay, like to ask, uh, like, how, how, what's, what started your, uh, I know, you, 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 you're a doctor, a by profession, but what started your love for basketball? I've, I've loved basketball since I was 12. I, I, I kind of started late, but since 12, I, uh, I consumed everything that was basketball. So be it PBA and later on NBA stuff. Back then, the internet wasn't the internet that we know today, so it was very hard to get books. So if you get, if you get a book, you get a magazine, you consume that. So I picked up a lot of information. Then I also played the game. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it helped me get through mathematics in school by changing the, the variables in the exam to basketball kind of variables. So it became more um, interesting for me. So basketball has been a big part of my life. Did you ever play? Uh, in school or Pasarel level? Wow, so for uh, what school? Um, Jason's Quezon City, uh, uh -huh. Memorial School. All right, 
Okay. And then where, where did you um, take up your um, uh, field? Right. Uh, I I took my master's in De La Salle, in the mm -hmm. main campus. It's a master's in guidance and counseling. Well, that's why we click. We're both uh, <laughs> green. Yeah. All right. And then, uh, yeah, sorry to... Yeah, no, 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 no. That, that you def that's definitely true. Uh, we bleed green and anyway. white. Uh, my, do my doctorate was also from the main campus. It was in counseling psychology. Mm -hmm. Then at that time, I realized that there wasn't really any formal training for sports psychology, which is the field that I really wanted to get into. So I took uh, courses in San Diego, in San Diego University for Integrative Studies. S-D-U-I-S mm -hmm. for a certificate in sports counseling. Mm -hmm. So that's um, my, my ultimate goal was to do it on every level, uh, specifically in basketball. So uh, I guess one more. And uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, soon, maybe, you know, we'll pray, yeah. I'll, I'll pray for that. Maybe. We'll never know. What does this journey will take us? Again, Doc, I don't want to, you know, I know it's not about uh, us. It's about uh, your topics, about you. Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, start off your, share your uh, presentation. Okay. Are you seeing it right? Yep, I see it. All um, right. So, okay, yeah. I just uh, wanted to thank you for this opportunity to be able to present. And uh, thank Blackwater also and Hoop Coaches International as well for this opportunity. And I hope our coaches can uh, learn something from this topic. Uh, whenever I give a talk, I always, I, always, I always want my audience to remember this acronym, AAQ. Always ask questions. And um, what this presentation is, this is uh, to honor the people who answered the, the, Google, the Google survey and questionnaire that I sent out, which I posted on the Hoops uh, International page. And um, there are 38 questions here that, uh, there are 38 questions here that mm -hmm. uh, we will we'll tackle. And Everybody just take a look at them. That might be your question. You may want to add on to it. So you can always, uh, Coach Ariel will field in any questions, be it from our international group that's watching now or everybody here. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right. And uh, also uh, Ian, Coach Ian ba Balete is uh, also joining us uh, to oh, help yeah. me field the questions. Uh, subbing in for your uh, uh, role. <laughs> right. I, uh, yeah. Yes. All right. It's true, it's true being in the spotlight now, I, I, I'm I'm happy with my role. <laughs> okay. All right. Next slide. Right. Right on. Okay. Um. I just again, Coach Ariel and I, we had a short background. Gave already my short background. Uh. The only thing, the only other thing that I can add is that I, I was a contributor for NBA.com Philippines for two years. That was a lot of fun. I got to meet um, players like Ron Harper, um, Robert Ori, among others. And I got to ask them the question that I asked the coaches, except from the players' perspectives. That's where that question comes from, if anybody's interested in knowing that. Mm -hmm. my, my signature question. I've, I have worked with teams that have uh, participated in the NCAA, UAAP, the PBL, the ABL, and now defunct PBL. Uh, part of my work is discretion. So unless Coach Ariel mentions it, I can't talk about any of the teams that I work for, but I can give, give very colorful examples. You can, you can. Okay. Any, any of the teams. Okay. Um, next slide, please. All right. All right. Um, in, in a nutshell, when, when people ask me what, what is a sports psychologist, I usually use the men in black as an example. 
And that basically means I am in the background. I am uh, an adjunct service for, for the coaching staff, for the head coach. And uh, I, if we're going to look at uh, an athlete as a stool, a stool that has three legs, you have one leg as the physical base, one leg is the spiritual base, and maybe the other leg is the mental base. I'm the one who works on, the, on that leg. And the idea behind it is if somebody were to sit on a stool, on this particular stool, and one of the legs were weak, then what happens to the stool? It, uh, it might crumble. So it's important that all the legs are strong, and I help in that particular area. Next slide, please. What's happening? Why it's not moving? All right, wait, wait. Uh... We can um, go out of this the slideshow and then we can just use, you know, we just click on the- Wait, wait up. If it's easy. My bad on that. Oh, there. Okay, next. It, it won't work right. on my uh, keyboard. It works on my cursor. All right, Doc, sorry yeah. to in interrupt. No, no problem. So again, there are 38 questions and I, I, I just moved some of the questions around, but this is what everybody has sent me and I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer it all. So of course, uh, some people are asking what is sports psychology? And according to the American Psychological Association, this is their their descript this is their um, definition they're in 2020. It is sports psychology is the use of psychological knowledge and skills to address the need for optimal performance and well-being and the well-being of athletes. So that's that's the reason why why teams get me uh, to help maybe improve in an area that is uh, defined by management, it's defined by by the coaches or maybe even the players themselves. Um, other roles of, of, a, uh, of sports psychology is to tackle social and developmental concerns in relation to sports participation. And finally, there are also systemic issues that a sports psychologist can address. So this could be organizational, this could be location-based. So uh, getting input from a sports psychologist and ask, asking them how it relates, at least from a psychological perspective that might give the owner, the management, the coaches, a more well-rounded decision, uh, more information to make a well-rounded decision. Uh, next question. Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Slide, For the next okay. question. Yep. That's okay. Good. All right. Good. Okay. So another question that was asked was, uh, what are the benefits of a sports psychologist? Now, in, in, in San Diego, there were, a, there were a, number of top, a number of topics, a number of subjects that, that dealt with sports psychology. And these are just some of them. Uh, adult fitness and performance. Assessment and evaluation is using uh, psychometric, psychometric uh, tools to, to make some assessments. Um, Dr. Versari, one of my, the owner of the school and, and uh, one of my mentors there, she made a note about NBA players that uh, the guards are usually very vocal and centers are usually very quiet. So that's some, that you can get that from an assessment. Uh, there's also nutrition and lifestyle management. So what, what the players eat, uh, that's, that's something that I can be consulted with as well. Though in my practice, I usually refer, I usually refer out, should this be the concern? And of course you have career transition and athletic retirement. What is career transition and, and athletic retirement? Basketball players have been playing the game of basketball their entire life. Now, What's nice in the Philippines is there's a premium in, in education. So they, they more often than not, they finish school. But in other countries, that may not necessarily be so. Do you guys remember the commercial of the NBA, stay in school, it's your best move? Coach mm -hmm. Young? Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. I think Reggie Miller's shooting a free throw and uh -huh. then he makes uh -huh. uh -huh. the ball. Stay in school, it's your best move. Now, mm -hmm. um, what Miller is talking about is not finishing college, it's finishing high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, given that a, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot more of their waking hour or their efforts are geared towards playing sports, when their career ends uh, prematurely 
or you know it, it takes its it, it it goes full circle they have nothing else to lean on so mm-hmm. they talk to somebody like me to help with that transition giving options and so on uh, if a if a player suffers a career ending injury and the only thing they know is basketball that that's at least in terms of um, how they see themselves it, it it takes a big it is it takes a big blow mm-hmm. so talking to me again is is another way to work around that and my services are not only extended to the the players it also goes maybe to the utility people to the coaches even management next uh, right. next slide Okay, how can a sports psychologist help teams and coaches? Okay, I mentioned uh, Dr. Vasari's, uh, uh, she used the Myers-Briggs type indicator, the MBTI, to, to see what personality types. Uh, and she, did, she used uh, this test with, with a number of NBA players. What's funny was uh, when I was in San Diego and then she was talking about it, I was able to name the players. And then she was surprised uh, that, that how did I know who the players were? Because it, it process of elimination with the, with the draft class, but that's a story for another time. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of assessment, especially draft assessment, uh, some teams, uh, I can't speak for all the teams, but I do know that the Boston Celtics do administer psychological tests with their rookies. And the reason why you do that is you also want to know um, the kind, the, the character of the, of of the player that you're, you're going to eventually draft and, and incorporate into your system. Mm-hmm. So, um, Ian or Coach Ariel, just jump in at any time if you want me to. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, anything, okay, guys? Yes. Because I can only see myself. Of course, you, yeah. You, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm not used to just seeing me. It's usually like, <laughs> yeah. I, I can see, uh, I can see how, how difficult it is now to be on this side of the, of the bench. Mm-hmm. So, Eddie, I have a question. Go, Ian. You mentioned that centers are quiet and guards are vocal. How about right. the forwards? Uh, I did not get that from Dr. Bersari. Maybe one of these days I'll ask her and I'll get back to you on that. Okay, thank you, Doc. All right. All right. Maybe somewhere in the middle, I think. Huh? But uh, that's a good question. I will ask her when I get, when I get a chance. Hey. Okay. Next question? All right. Uh, huh? Question number four. Okay. Um, favorite I don't question. Know if, uh, oh, that's your favorite I, question. <laughs> I don't know if our respondents are just uh, messing. Hey, what them. what are the top five qualities <laughs> that a sports psychologist, with your <laughs> years of experience, yeah, uh, so, that the sports psychologist should possess in order for him to be successful? Okay. I really gave this Thank a you. lot of thought because I. <laughs> I asked this of all of our, our, our guests in the webinar and, and you know when I talk to basketball players, I ask them the same thing because I am, I am genuinely interested to know what their answers are. My, my, uh, my hope is that one day and hopefully one day soon, I'm going to compile it all and, and come up with it. Then. So I'm really uh, excited with that. So on my end, as a sports psychologist, it's this. Number one is have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Uh, at the top of the show, we talked about it. You asked me how I got uh, into this and my love of basketball. That's, that's it. Uh, if you, it's something that you're genuinely interested in, um, things, it becomes easy. Um, you pick up, you just have to keep on reading. Read, read, read. There's a quote on my website that I still use until today. Uh, it's from the father of Gilbert Arenas, Gilbert Arenas Sr. And Gilbert Arenas Sr. says, he told, he told young uh, Gilbert Jr., see, Agent, uh, Agent Zero, he told him, while you're at home resting, someone else out there is working hard. That's a, that's a quote that really stuck me for the longest time. Another one is, is uh, my mom, who's also a psychologist, Dr. Adido Villasar. Uh, growing up, she instilled in me that the only time you ever stop learning is when you die. So we, we are all, every day when we wake up, we have another chance to learn more. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so during this time of, uh, of COVID, you know, I, I'd like our coaches and everybody else who's listening, you know, never let your, your physical boundaries or physical limitations stop you from learning. You know, uh, listen to webinars like this, 
listen to audio books, listen to podcasts, listen to tutorials on, on, uh, on YouTube. There are many sources for you to learn. So take that opportunity. Number two, be credentialed. Through sacrifice and determination, earn the privilege to be of assistance to, to others. I don't take that very lightly. I, uh, I wanted to make sure that I was prepared to, to you know, if I was I gonna see a, a collegiate team, a, a semi-professional team, a professional team. Uh, I wanted to be in the best possible uh, spot that I would be able to answer hopefully every question or situation. Now, you can't be good at everything, but, you know, uh, it, this links with number three. Stay within your core competencies. Uh, back in the day, wrestling was really big when I was growing up. And there are these really big wrestlers that only stay on the ground. They never go up on the turnbuckle and they jump. One time, there was this one wrestler that did that, and it turned the tide and he lost the match. And then the announcer said, this is my number one rule. Always stay within your core competencies. Stay within the areas that you know you are good at and excel in. Then I guess from there later on, you expound. Okay, so that's, that's another important thing to have. And that's why for me, in a, uh, if, so, if a team approaches me, hey, can you work with our team? If it's basketball, right, it's no problem. But if it's another sport, I tell them, I'm, I'm very honest with them. I tell them that, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly that version of that sport, but if you can give me a little time to work on it, you know, I could mm -hmm. I'll probably, you know, let's do it. Okay, number four, it's always about the team and not about you. If the team has any success, it wasn't mm -hmm. because of the sports psychologist. The sports psychologist did, its, did his or her part. We're not, they're not the main reason why. Uh, I've heard stories of other people in my profession that, that you know, we can't wait to tell other people about it. And, and I'm disheartened when I hear that because if somebody knows that you do good work, they'll know about it. You know, if, if you do good work, people will know about it. You don't have to tell people that you did good work. And not lastly, number five is to stay humble and remember to give back. So I guess depending, in my private practice, depending on the cases, there might, there might need, be a need to really help other people out. And I, I don't hesitate to, because you know, the opportunity to be of help to somebody else, um, not everybody has that. And I, 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 I'm very happy that I can be of service. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll read the question. Huh? Could okay. you tell us more uh, about your journey to being a sports psychologist so that uh, you Great. feel that you're with someone? Okay, thanks so much. Okay. It's, it's a big help. Really appreciate it. Um, growing up, I had a list of three things that I wanted to be. Like any other kid of my, of my generation, I wanted to play basketball. I wanted to play in the PBA. I wanted to have a life that... that uh, revolved around basketball. Mm -hmm. Then as I got a little bit older, I realized it wasn't ex that's not exactly for everyone. So number two was to be a doctor. And number three was to be a psychologist. And by being a psychologist, specifically a sports psychologist, uh, I'm able to do all. I'm gonna, I get to still be involved in the game. I, I, I'm hospital-based. So I, when I'm not uh, working with... Uh, clients in the, in the field of sports and there. Um, just to give you guys an idea of how, how my work is like, especially from an ethical perspective. Let's say for example, a coach refers a swimmer to me. And during my initial, my initial talk, my initial session with the swimmer, we find out that uh, it's not only motivation that's the concern, the underlying concern, but the presenting concern is that she has body dysmorphic disorder. Body dysmorphic disorder is there's, there's a tendency to compare yourself with other people and, and usually it involves uh, weight. And you know, some people are built big, some bigger, some people are built smaller. And you can't, you can, if you're built bigger, you can't exactly weigh a certain amount. So 
as a sports psychologist, the body dysmorphic disorder is usually has to be referred to a clinical or a counseling psychologist. <coughs> Excuse me. That's dealt with first, and then it's referred back to the sports psychologist to deal with the motivational concern. Because I am a counseling psychologist as well as a sports psychologist, I can do both. So that's uh, some of the advantages of, uh, of my job and my specialization. So, so there, um, much like everybody, uh, it was a dream to make it to the big leagues in, mm -hmm. in some form or some way. And, uh, and having, having had the opportunity to, to do my craft in, in five different leagues, you know, I, I've, I've met that dream to, to some extent. Uh, Doc, we have a question from Mark Jason Mendoza. Doc okay. Teddy, how did you take your certification? Is is an on is it an online course? How much did it cost you? I'm a physician. Can I have myself certified as well? Thank you. Okay, that's um that's a good question. Uh, the school. One of the reasons why I went to San Diego University for integrative studies was because. Of all the schools I wrote, that was the one school that wrote me back. Uh, they used to offer distance learning programs for that. And another, another reason why I went to them is all the teachers who wrote the books taught at, at, at one time or another in that school. Mm -hmm. But because of uh, California uh, regulations, I think in terms of education, the school had to shift to... Um, uh, in English as a, as a second language. So I don't think they offer my program anymore. I'm like, uh, I'm probably like Luke Skywalker, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I think I, I, I came around at the right time to be able to take it. But right now, I don't think it's offered in, in San Diego University for Integrative Studies. You could try another school. Yeah, I hope that answered the uh, Yes, yes, it did. Yeah. One of our YouTube viewers has a question, Dr. Teddy. Uh, si Raj Cabatuanjo. What's the and, question? Um, are, are there many other sports psychologists uh, also working in the Philippines or is this more of an international level? Thing? I've, I've met a couple, but uh, a lot of them are research-based. A lot of them work with, with uh, different... Uh, Olympic teams for the Philippines, like water polo, and um, but I, I think there is a need for it. Uh, I think there could be more. The thing is, if you're solely going to be a sports psychologist, I, you know, my, I would be the first one to say, you know, that shouldn't be the primary. It should be the secondary because of the number of opportunities that are actually available. It, it's uh, to be very honest, it's a few and far between. And if there is an opportunity. Um, it would pro it's probably not going to pay as much as you think. That's the reality. Uh, uh, if there's one thing about me, I'm also very honest. So I will. So yeah. it's it's not yet a um, unknown field in it's, it's, uh, Philippines, it's, it's, or how is it? it? It's there. It's not. There's just not a lot of people that will do it at this level. Mm -hmm. a, a large part, a large part is, a lot of people don't know what it is that a sports psychology that uh, a sports psychologist does, or um, how it can contribute into a team setting. Mm -hmm. So it's um, especially if it's it's not part of the Olympic the Olympic teams. So it's more of your awareness level, wala pa yeah. dito. Right. And if you look at the first couple of questions, it was geared towards that, building awareness. All right. Thank you, Doc, for answering. Yeah. Our next question, are you open to pursuing a career in basketball coaching? Yeah. You know, Coach Ariel doesn't know this, but there was a time maybe 10 years ago, give or take, I... I talked to one of the coaches who was currently the head coach of one of the UAP teams. And I said, coach, I mean, he knew that I was practicing sports psychology. Um, I'm willing to do anything. 
to be part of the coaching team, the coaching, the uh, the field of coaches that he had. And he said yes. And and sadly, um, he was replaced before the season. The season started. So, Aray. yeah. Well, that. And then there was another chance later on down the line. But it it also made me realize that uh, I if I got in. And my only, my only, the only contribution I could make was only from, the, uh, from being a sports psychologist. I might as well just be a sports psychologist, because um, the, the coaching it really entails a lot of long hours, that, which I am willing to do. But now that I'm older, you know, I think my role now is where I'm really supposed to be. My mom used to say, "If it's meant for you, it'll come easy." So it, but it's sort of like it's, it'll slip in. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to, to try hard and, and work hard and, and struggle. That's all there. But you know your place. And I, I think uh, my role as a sports psychologist for a team, that's where I'm supposed to be. That's how I can be of most help to a team. Never so, know, Doc. You'll never know. Yeah, well, if, if I'm asked, yeah. you know, why not? You never know. If, they, if a door is open, you always, you always have to take a look at it. Mm -hmm. um, All right. Next, uh, would would studying a psychology course be an advantage to a basketball coach? Uh, this is a very good question. It's uh, the first person that comes to mind is Phil Jackson. When Phil Jackson was playing with the New York Knicks, I'm sure you guys know that he won two championships with the Knicks. The second championship team, he. Uh, was inactive because of a uh, back injury. And during that time, he went back to university and he took uh, classes uh, in psychology. So how did that work for him? Uh, he did very well with the Bulls in managing personalities. I guess it, uh, it uh, in some form or some way, it helped him to understand uh, the, different type of, the different types of personalities and what is needed to put it all together. So is it going to be an advantage? Yes. However, it, you can finish a course, but it, it is what you make of it. You know, um, if somebody were to finish psychology now, before they can call themselves a psychologist, they have to finish at least their master's. I didn't do any, I didn't work with any clients or patients until I was, I was in, in, I was taking my doctorate already. So having this, this kind of interaction and observation, it really helps before you, before you talk immediately to a player and try to address all of their issues as a coach. You can always talk to a player. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you open Pandora's box and it's something that you can't close and the situation grows bigger, then it becomes a problem. So to answer the question, question number seven, of course, it's an advantage. But it doesn't. It should not stop with that course. It should, you know, you should go further than that. You should talk to more people about that uh, in in the field and, and see how they would handle it because it it, all, it only makes you a better coach. All right, that makes me think. I uh, I should st study psychology now. And the coach Ariel, lalo na maraming webinars, di ba? Oh, all right. Uh, we go to the next question before we go to the Q and A again. So, how do you apply basketball philosophies in your team building and counseling sessions? It's a, that's a trade secret. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 um, Coach Ariel has experienced a lot of my of my sessions, and I have I have usually when I do team buildings, I have one rule. My rule is that you know they can't record. My team build session because that's that's your tools of the trade. So, but in terms of basketball philosophies, of course, and if you really read into everything that I'm telling you right now, at one point or another, that that, that does come up in my presentations. Now, in terms of counseling, counseling sessions, um, especially if I know that my patient is a big basketball fan, using. Um, uh, uh, a game situation or a player situation, a player story may make us uh, get that much closer to, to them understanding where I'm coming from as well as, as, well as uh, what they're trying to point out with me. So yeah, um, 
basketball plays a big part uh, when I do therapy and when I work with teams in a team building in a in a team building session. All right. And Next. don't worry if they're I don't know they're gonna ask if I can share anything. And I just want you to know in this presentation, I'm gonna have one activity, and that's gonna be for everybody and every everybody at home or wherever you guys are. Um, you do it with me. So I, I at least you can experience how I would do an activity if I was with one of these teams. So that's wow. here on down the line. Okay, that's my uh free activity. That's my free activity. <laughs> Interactive webinar. Yeah. Uh, there's one question. Uh, what are some signs that it might be time to see a sports psychologist? Um, From I'm, one of our anonymous uh, attendees. Well, I wouldn't even... Okay. okay. Um, a lot of people, like, like there's some players who have come to see me, uh, ex-players who have come to see me with the idea that it is a sports psychology, a sports psychology problem. But after talking to them, it turns out it was maybe a counseling psychology or, um, or a clinical concern. So as I mentioned at, at, at the start, you know, that's something that you have to deal with first before you can talk about the sport concern. It might not even be a sports concern. So during this time of, of COVID-19, they, they, one, one section of the mental health practitioners believe that the next wave will be uh, mental health concerns. So if a person feels that there is a need to see a psychologist, it doesn't hurt to see one, even just for an initial consult. The beauty is nobody has to know that you saw that person. Uh, it's men in black, right? So it, now, it, uh, that's on the part of the psychologist. If, if the patient or, 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 or the counselee or the player decides to post on their Facebook, that they saw a therapist, then that's their prerogative. All right. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. We go to the next uh, question. How does one enter the field of sports psychology? Um, I think it's related okay. to. Uh, right. Um, just to add to what I said earlier, but that all falls into place. Uh, my suggestion is you have a background in counseling or clinical psychology. And I don't mean a distance learning class. I need, I, you have to see face-to-face -to -face with your teachers. I, I know that's a bit difficult right now because of the ECQ and, and everything that's happening in the world. But once the world gets to be where it's supposed to be, having a face-to-face, -face, um, you know, seeing your teacher, being in a class, experiencing it with classmates, um, I, I, I strongly suggest a degree in clinical or counseling psychology, because those are the foundations of sports psychology. If you take a distance class immediately without this, you're going to have a difficult time. Because when I took my, my distance learning classes, I fell on my counseling psychology uh, training. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Dr. Teddy, are there any uh, colleges or universities here in the Philippines offering courses in sports psychology? Uh, you know, you know the questions that the, you ask the players, like who is your who is your top five teammates? That's that's good. That's th this question is that version for me. If I answer that, it's it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be really difficult. So that's probably the one question I'll have to pass on. Uh, not not you know to be evasive about it. I'm pretty sure if you research online, the university will come out. Okay. But uh, maybe um, if that person asks me in a different forum, I'll, I'll have a different okay. answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next See question. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Why does a player choke under pressure? This is a good question. I, I... Yeah, th this is the very first question that was asked of me during the. I just want to credit. I just want to credit the. Well, I'll have to look at it through my notes, but I, this is the very first question that was asked. And I, I really thought about it and I wanted to take some time to answer it. It's after uh, the men in black picture, this is the only other pictures in the whole presentation. That's how, that's how much time I gave this. Not that I didn't give the others the same amount of time, but this is a topic that's close to my heart. When you tell a player or somebody that they choke, it's probably the most horrible thing you can tell a person. 
And the reason why is you're only basing it on that one single moment. We heard, um, we heard uh, Coach, um, our, our b-ball breakdown, Coach. Nick. Uh, Nick, Coach Nick. Co- Coach Nick, my apologies if you're watching this. Coach, Coach Nick saying he, he devotes part of his practice for his players to throw co- cross-court passes. So for those of you who attended his lecture, I'm sure you remember that. He even showed video of his players doing it. Now, that's key. Why? Because how can you expect a player to make that kind of a pass if they've never been in that situation? Okay, so the same is true with a player uh, shooting crucial, crucial uh, foul shots or, 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 or a game-tying shot and, 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 and they not being able to make it. If a player misses that, are they automatically a choker? It's, it's very harsh. And the reason I say that is this. Everybody adores Michael Jordan. But Michael Jordan had a co- commercial a couple of years ago, a lot, many, many years ago, that highlighted how many misses he had to make. But all of our highlights only show the shots that he makes. So that doesn't make him a choker. It's just he put himself in a position to, to try to do his best and it didn't happen. So that being said, this brings us to Nick Anderson. Now, I'm not singling out Nick, but his case, it, his case is projected over a period of time. It is something that he has also openly talked about. And you know, if he was, if he was this generation's player, I think it will be even harder on him with social media. At the, at the time, in 1995, social media wasn't where it, it was yet, but Nick Anderson never forgot um, the game one of the 1999, 1995 NBA Finals against Houston. Now, just to refresh everybody's memory for that, um, there were 10.5 seconds left. Nick was fouled. He missed both foul shots. With 7.7 seconds, 7. seconds left, he got the offensive rebounds, and he missed the next two. This led to Kenny Smith hitting a three, which forced overtime, and at the tip end of Olajuwon with... The tip, the tip in of a larger one with 0.3 seconds left. The Magic were swept in that series. And um, Nick Anderson, uh, he's a career 70% shooter at that time. He did well the following year at about 69%. After that, at um, 40% from the field, like 40% from the line. It came to the point that Anderson was uh, liability, a liability to keep on the court. Um, during the closing moments because he uh, did not want to get fouled. He wasn't, he wasn't going to be as aggressive as he would normally have been in the early stage of his, of his career. He, um, he said, uh, can we get to the next uh, slide, please? He said, Coach Tech, okay. it affected the way I played. It affected the way I lived. It played in my head like a recorder over and over again. Now, uh, coaches or, or players who are watching this, you know, basketball is, uh, is muscle memory. When, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a game of reactions. If you're thinking, like if you're going to take a free throw, at least from a psychological perspective, it can have an, an effect on you. And clearly for Nick Anderson, it affected him. Stayed with the Magic for 10 years. Then he had stints with other teams. He played a total of 13 years. He's a really good player. I think he could have played longer if he was able to overcome that moment. In the next slide, um, just to show you that I'm not <laughs> making this up, you can, you can see the, the free throw percentage of uh, Anderson on the far most right corner. If you look at the last, you know, after the 95 season, after, even after the 94-95 season, he had one good year. Then after that, if you look at the percentages, or even how aggressive he was getting to the foul line as compared to the early part of his career, um, that, that is a cause of concern. Now, uh, I'm, I, my hope is that Nick talked to somebody, but somebody asked where a sports psychologist can come in. We can come in there. That's one of the areas that we can help in, hopefully. But again, like uh, one of our, one of our um, guests on the webinar did say that, you know, in practice, that's how you're supposed to shoot free throws. Like, oh, that's Coach Jeff, Jeffrey Carriasso. Um, you, 
you, you have the game is on the line and these are the two free throws that you have to hit. Or maybe you have a, a thinking of, of, of Larry Bird, where in, you know, the game is tied and there's, uh, there's no, uh, no time left in the clock and you have to hit these two free throws. It's like you're shooting the free throws from, from his barn back in, uh, in Indiana, that kind of thing. So I hope that answers uh, the question on choking. Never define choking on one single incident. I would rather that it be based on, on facts and, and looked at over a period of time. Because once you label somebody like that, you never want to be labeled like that. Because it, it can stay with you, especially now in this age of social media, you know, where it is uh, unforgiving. unforgiving. How about the PJ Carlissimo uh, choking? Okay. <laughs> All right. Can I, uh, can I... All right. Can I share screen? Sure. Wait. Uh, I'll stop mine. Hey. Okay. Um, I only learned how to do this the other day, so I'm so excited to use it now. It's the whiteboard. Okay. Okay. So if you guys are familiar with, whenever I'm asked about the PJ Carlissimo incident, I usually draw this. This is a bell curve. A bell curve has three points. The beginning, the highest point, the apex of the bell curve, and back to the ready state. So this is in line together, right? These two points. Now, what happened in the choking incident? None of us will really know because none of us were there. But it came to the point that um, Latrell Sprewell couldn't stand his coach anymore and put his hands on him. And Latrell has really big hands. So uh, you guys know the story. He got suspended. You know that, that there was a black eye in his career moving forward. Now, what do I think happened? There are three points. If a, a, this is where a person is, when they're not angry, this is when they're like super angry that the only thing they see is red. You know, they're not thinking straight anymore. They're just reacting. So that's, that's our choking incident. And then back to normal. Now, obviously the back to normal, the aftermath, we can't do anything about it anymore. We choke, you know, the deed is done. The choking happened. At this point, the apex, he's really super angry. There's probably at 6'5", built the way, the way he's built. If he really wanted to hurt somebody, nobody could stop him. We can't do anything at that point. Maybe his, his taller teammates could have tried to stop them. But, you know, again, we weren't there. We don't know what happened. But it came to the point, um, if he was level-headed, if, if Latrell was at this point, Mm -hmm. He probably wouldn't have done what he did. But something happened along the way that made him get to this point for him to do what he did. And by the time it was all over, you know, there's, we're, we're going to have to, you know, a sorry won't be enough. Because it's a, it's a you know, he's a, he, he was the face of Golden State and that, that kind of thing. So there's some, a lot of other variables involved. So to answer the question of Coach Ariel, what can we do? Obviously, telling them about it at this point can't help because of course they're going to say, I'll never do that. When they're angry, you can't talk to them because they're only see red, you know, only what's directly in front of them. The aftermath, you can't do anything because it's finished. Deed is done. So what can be done? You need to identify what the triggers are. What is the stuff that makes you angry? So when you see mm -hmm. it, it's happening. You can walk away from it. That's the, that is the only way. Anybody who ever tells you that they can control their anger or they'll never get angry again, it, it doesn't work that way. Eventually, there'll be a wrong time, wrong place, wrong situation, and they may do something that they're going to regret. Sorry, Doc. So this, this uh, it's a bell, right? It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a bell curve. A bell curve. Okay. Uh, for, uh... It originally looks like this. Okay, okay. So there's three points. The starting point, the highest uh -huh. point, and back uh -huh. to the starting point. So I just use that as my example to, yeah. to explain this. All right. All right. Um, okay. Presentation uh, again. Yeah. Presentation questions. Okay. Uh-huh. The next one. Is this the next one? Yeah, that's the next one. A team has players with different ages. How... Do you approach or deal with that age gap? 
you know what's nice at basketball is uh, it, it, it crosses uh, age gaps. So if it's um, one way of me relating to younger players or, or younger patients is I have to know the players that they idolize, that mm -hmm. they know. Mm -hmm. So I, I, have to, I have to be abreast. I have to know what LeBron James did. You know, that, that, uh, you know he's, he's dancing in a TikTok video with his kids, you know, that, that kind of thing. I have to know stuff like that because I never know, at least in, in, in my line of work, where I'm going to be able to draw from that example and use it. I can't always use a Larry Bird example or a Michael Jordan example because those guys haven't played in a really long time. So now, now it's the age of the Luka Doncic, the Ben Simmons, and uh, Donovan Mitchell, those kind, those kind of players. You don't, there probably won't be a Dwayne Wade example anymore since he's retired already. You should need something fresh and something current, something that they like. Now, I don't have to know everything about the players, but if I can know a couple of things, it, it certainly helps. All right. Our next uh, question, Doc. What are the differences of your approach to players and to coaches? When, when I initially, uh, my idea for sports psychology that I was going to work purely with um, players and with the coaches, and then I realized that there's a third group and that is management. Mm -hmm. And what what I have done as I've, I've gotten older and I've progressed in my practice is I, I, have, to go through, I have to go through management, uh, the coaches, even before I get to the players. And what I, I, what, I, what I do is I make it really easier for everybody. I have, I have a certain idea of, of certain philosophy. And if it's good for management, then I bring it to the coaches. If it's good for coaches, then we're going to bring it to the players. And I've, I've worked with really professional teams, professional coaches, professional people, and uh, I'm happy to say that you know they, especially during my last one, you know they they mm -hmm. appreciated how I saw uh, the game of bas basketball and how I was how I was going to approach uh, a team building or how I was going to approach the players or the coaches. All right, and uh, Doc was uh, talking about Blackwater, right? Yes, coach. Uh, we, we had a um, session with Doc, and um, I knew it was going to be a su success because um, uh, we had uh, previous um, team building sessions with Doc with my other teams, and so I I uh, suggested that Doc will uh, facilitate our team building with Blackwater, and I received um, uh, all but all. Uh, feedbacks was uh, very positive and encouraging. So, thank like you, Doc, thank, for that. Uh, Blackwater again for the opportunity to okay. be a part of their team building. So, again, if you want uh, team building sessions with your team, you can contact us, Hoop Coaches International, and uh, Doc Teddy will uh, get. Uh, we will get your. Uh, uh, we'll give. The information well i'll give you more than happy to give you the information of doctor all right what was okay. your most memorable encounter with the basketball player slash team okay um again at the start of the at the start of the show i told you i i couldn't uh, act, talk about the teams that are the players that i have worked with because again you know discretion so what i did was uh to answer this question I talked about the players that I could talk about. And uh, in, during the global games, we're in uh, the Rockets. Uh, the Rockets faced uh, the Pacers, if I'm not mistaken. They brought in uh, several NBA players. Uh, and one of them was uh, Ron Harper, who had an opportunity to sit down and talk to for, for quite some time. And if you're going to ask me the question, uh, if I asked him the question, yeah, I did. I did ask him the same question that I've asked our coaches and, and Asi. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Uh, um, the highlight of this was if you're looking, if you can look at his uh, left hand, he's actually wearing one of his uh, Lakers championship rings, mm -hmm. which I got to see up close. It's quite, it's, quite, uh, it's quite amazing to see up close. <laughs> 
So he allowed us to take a picture of it, but he was moving his hand, so the picture didn't exactly come out so well. But uh, you know, uh, I tried to keep the the interview as professional as possible. That was a memorable encounter for me. All right. How does sports affect the mental well-being of a person? Okay, so um, if wow, you just very technical, to a, yeah, from a biological base, um, and you know, in any activity, any physical activity, especially it's one that, that you know you enjoy, there is a release of endorphins, and this this translates to stress reduction or or, or a high feeling. Maybe that's why. You know, um, at least when I was back in school, I always wanted to play basketball uh, during lunchtime and after school or any other time that I got a chance to play, largely because of that. Um, sports also has a calming effect. So, you know, because of an increase in body, press, uh, body temperature. And I remember, um, you know, players like Michael Jordan always saying like, you know, uh, when they can get away from it all when they're playing the game of basketball. Maybe this is one of the reasons why. Because there's no other place they could just be themselves and, and be most comfortable. And um, it also, it helps, the ment the, it helps your mental well-being as well when um, you, you experience success. And I guess that's one, of the, one thing that I love about sports is, you know, unlike if you're going through an academic year in school, you know, you won't know what the results are until the end. In sports, clock always goes back to zero. You can always play another game. There's always another opportunity. And there's always another learning. All right. The next, what mental exercises or activities can you recommend to help us with the, this COVID-19 pandemic ordeal we are going through? Okay, um, this is another question that I gave a lot of thought to. And, and what's first thing, before any mental exercise and activity, you guys really have to know what, what we're going through. What are we going through? As of uh, May 14, 2020, the Department of Health has listed 8,749 active cases for for for, for this, this COVID pandemic that we're going through now. I'm not gonna go into you know, uh, how many deaths there were. Just, just imagine that sheer number. And those are the people who have been tested. We, you know, we don't have the, uh, that wide. Uh, I think nobody in the world yet has that wide a testing uh, scope to deal with this. Plus, you know, the only way that things can go back to Faster is we have we have to you know we have to cut this uh, where we can and, and do our part and and that's by staying home social distancing and taking the proper precautions because until such time as there is the vaccine you know it, it this is pretty much how we're going to be now why am I saying that because people are going to expect that once the, the the quarantine and your respective countries are, are lifted, that quote unquote things are gonna go back or you're gonna go back to normal. Now, that's a nice thought, but if you get sick, at least in the Philippines, is there going to be, and, and it's not asymptomatic, and is there gonna be a hospital that will be able to take you and treat you? Do you have the funds to to be treated, you know, these are a lot of questions that uh, that have to be answered. So, so being at home first, knowing that you're doing your part and staying at home, is important. Number two, and I understand there's economic hardships in any country, especially especially in the Philippines. But staying at home really is is the the best way that we can do this. Um, there is a term out there that's called tolerance of risk. And this has been floated around in, in NBA circles. What is tolerance of risk? Tolerance of risk is you're getting a player used to the idea of taking a risk. That means, you know, as Mark Cuban says, you, you are putting your life in, on other people that you trust. 
And we there is a tolerance of risk every day. Every day that you drive your car, every day that you cross the street, every day that you ride the bus, you ride the plane, there's a tolerance of risk. But now we have, we have an unseen variable here. We don't know if the person in front of us um, is infected or not. So before any mental health exercise and activity, you need to know that you're doing your part by staying at home. Now, what mental exercise and activity can be done? You guys are already doing it now, attending webinars like this, educating yourself, maybe educating yourself in something that you've always said that you wanted to do but never had time to do it. You know, now is the time. It's, um, the world isn't as big as it used to be. The internet makes it smaller. Take, take, a, take short courses. Again, I mentioned others earlier, listen to an audio book. Take every waking day as an opportunity to learn something, get something done. If you always dreamt about writing a book, now's the time to do it. If, if, if I, 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 uh, uh, I see one of the professional basketball players has taken up painting and he's making a lot of uh, portraits now, best time to do it. Aside from uh, you know, his regular exercises, read books. These are the things that you can that, that you can do. And most importantly, your mindset should never be by the end of the quarantine. I'm thinking, think until December. Now, why am I saying think until December? Uh, I'm, I'm, am I not an optimist? Why am I thinking of the negative? On the contrary, I'm, I, I say that for your benefit. Why? Because in your mind, if you're thinking December and when the quarantine is lifted or if ever it's lifted, doesn't happen before that time, then you don't get disappointed. You still have a positive frame of mind versus you're always thinking when the quarantine ends, that's when you're gonna get things rolling. Then it's gonna be harder. It's like doing a push-up. If, you're, if, you're, if you have some pressure in your push-up, it's easier to do a push-up than a dead push-up. So those are the exercises, how you can keep positive, you be productive. All right. Uh, what mental exercise or activities can you recommend for someone to be clutch or under pressure? All right. Or face um, under pressure. Sorry. Okay. Again, I, I gave this example earlier for, for mm -hmm. Coach Nick. Yeah. The cross court pass. Now, for the visualization script. Um, okay. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. With the rising concern of mental health oh, in the workplace. Is that it? Is that the next slide? That's the next. Okay, sorry. Could you could we go back? Sorry, I thought it was in the I got okay. the number and stuff. Okay. So a visualization script is yeah. uh, it's like what coach um, it's what coach Jeff told us the other day. You're imagining yourself with no time remaining or with three seconds left on, on the game clock. And you're, you're on the line, you're gonna take these two free throws and you have to nail them. You need to put yourself in those situations. Um, you know, that's why the coaches, they practice uh, after timeout, after timeout plays. Uh, and, 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 you know, coaches, you guys know this, that uh, the, the objective of a play is not a made shot, it's to put a player in the best position to, to make a shot, just to take the shot. So for somebody to be clutch, it's, it's repetition. And so you, if you visualize yourself doing it, then hopefully it will, it will become a reality. So you work with certain scenarios and, and that's how you do it. So let's say um, you, you, your offhand is, is, that, is what you have to work on. So mm -hmm. you, you, you go through a routine or you visualize yourself and maybe actually doing it, having to go to your offhand and then rising up and having to take that sort of a shot. Uh, Stephen Curry is probably the best, the best example, you know, with, the, with, the, with this training regimen and what he does. He's preparing for every, uh, every scenario. And I think uh, one of our other coaches showed us that when he shoots uh, from far away, and then he, he comes closer. That's just so that um, you know he's also prepared for, for those kinds of situations. And he has won some games. 
uh, prepared for that. Because how can you take a half court shot and make it with the kind of accuracy that, or, or consistency that he has made it if he hits something that he has not practiced? So that's how you can be clutch, repetition, seeing yourself in that position. Because if you never see yourself in the position that you're actually going to get the ball and have the opportunity to be clutch, when it actually happens, you want to know what to do. Because you never saw yourself being there in the first place. With the rising concern of mental health in the workplace, how does sport, uh, how does a sports psychologist handle, uh, manage the health, the mental health of players, especially the younger ones? Right. Um, again, you know, like like now, uh, now if if um, I was with a team full time, this would be probably my busiest time because I'll have to talk to each one of the players, you know, because each one of them are going to have different concerns, concerns of not playing, the contracts coming up, you know, financial concerns, uh, health concerns, all of this is, is, is going to, is going to come up. So they, right now, how are they going to do it? Um, in that hypothetical situation, if, if I was a part of a sports team, I would, I would meet with them often. Maybe we can touch base once a week. And not only, it's not only for the coaches, you know, management and, and, and the coaches, they want to avail of my services as well. And from there, we can, we can design a program or an intervention that would best deal with uh, the presenting concern because you can, there's no... There's no, okay, this is the concern and this is how you're going to handle it. it does, in my line of work, it doesn't exactly work that way because uh, everybody's different. There are times that there could be some similarities, but it never really is the same in terms of an intervention. So that's it. Uh, keeping in, in touch with them, asking them um, what their concerns are, if there's something that they want to talk about. Of course, it also depends on their level of uh, comfortability with me. So if they're if they're comfortable with me, then maybe they'll be more open. All right. Yeah. Right. How do you build rapport with the players? You know, um, the one time that I was really able to experience that was with Toyota Otis. Toyota Otis, um, that's a with Coach Ariel, uh, who gave me permission to talk about it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, when Toyota Otis and the PBL hired me as their sports psychologist, it it uh, it gave me it gave me uh, free reign as to how as to uh, in terms of an opportunity to build rapport. Now, how do I do that? Um, as he mentioned earlier, Tao Lava mentioned earlier that he has some teammates that if their practice is at ten o'clock uh, in the morning five or six o'clock in the morning, some of his teammates are there and they're taking shots already. Mm -hmm. I'd be there at five. And the reason for that is the pre-game, pre-practice, pre-game, that's, that's, that, that's the time that I can possibly have with the players because when it's actually game time, that's the, the only voice that should be heard is the head coach's voice after the game or after the practice, nobody will want to talk to me because they want to go home. They want to do other things. So one of my challenges to myself, you know, uh, whether I'm, I'm, I'm hired on an interim basis or, or with a team for a short period of time or, or like with the Toyota Otis on, on a prolonged period of time, I'm always the first one in practice. Like the lights are not even open yet. I'm already there. So it gives you, it gives, it, it's a down moment that I can talk to a player maybe before while they're taping. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, like uh, to some credit, uh, there have been times I've been observing practice and some of the players have actually come up to me and, and talked to me. So I, I, I appreciate that as well. But as, as usually the newcomer coming in, I'm the one who has to make an effort to, to speak with the players, management, or coaches. And I don't really mind doing that. It's part of my job. Mm -hmm. Next, what are the challenges in building rapport with the players? Uh, well, they may not know what my job is there, which is the reason why 
especially as I, as I have gone through my practice, I make it a point that management know, you know, has a good idea of what I'm going to do, what I can do, what I will do. The coaches also know the same thing. And it's usually easier to, it's easier to, uh, for, 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 to build rapport with the players. But to have the kind of rapport, I think that whoever the coaches that ask me this question is like to have a deeper connection with them. I have, I, I think I'll have to be part of the team on, on at least a, at least for a conference. I mean, for talking PBA, at least for a conference. You know, um, yeah. All right. More time. Time is, time is really the answer to that. Uh, do you consider timing when uh, talking to players? Is it during, before, or after practice? I think uh, you mentioned uh, okay. Again, the just to answer, to answer this, um, these 38 questions, the coaches who answered this and they sent this, I really do appreciate you taking time out of your evening or your day to answer them. Uh, I'm, I put it all down. I'm going to answer all of your questions. And I, I, again, uh, like I said earlier, the time, the perfect time for me would be before practice or before the games. Preferably, I think, before practice because the games, their, their players are usually zeroed in already on, on the game plan and what needs to be done. I don't want to get in the way of that. It is truly the time of the head coach already. What are the opportunities of being a sports psychologist in the Philippines? I think uh, you tackled that, but uh, answer it yeah. also. Yeah, there, I feel there are many opportunities with um, national team sports. Now, everybody's going to want basketball, for sure. But, you know, there are other sports there that do need help. And... Um, Especially if you know they're open. I mean, they, they probably can't pay anything because they they have no budget to speak of to begin with. So if that's if that's something a, a sports psychologist would want to do, the opportunity is there. Even even if it's just to gain experience working with in a team setting. What are the best approaches for children ages twelve and below? I like being honest. I don't like to beat around the bush. I, um, if a kid is five years old, I think they're too young. Maybe you just give them one more year to mature. You know, they, they may see the world differently. Um, another good approach is you, you must also know what, what the foundation is like. So how did the parents, how did the grandparents see the world? How did they, you know, how, how did they raise this young, uh, young girl or young boy? Um, from there, I can I, I know what approach to take. But if you're talking about best approach, uh, I, I guess being honest with them. Be number one for me. Yep. What would be the right approach to boost their self-esteem? All right. So we have this is the one that I, I thought I was. Hey, nah. All right, nah, nah. This is my activity, guys. So. Uh, okay. Right. I'll, 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 so um, stand up a bit. Slide. Okay. Uh, Iberito's joining us also. Uh, just uh, Iberito is a, uh, from, all the way from Cebu. Just came off work. Okay. He under time. <laughs> so, I, yeah. I, blew, I blew off a meeting, Doc Ted, for you. Oh, I, I, hope it's, uh, <laughs> I hope I can live up to your expectation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you are. I was listening the entire time. So, like, I'm, I'm very, just like everyone else here, I'm very, very thankful. We're glued. We're glued, Doc. This, uh, this is, this is a free, uh, ex amount of, uh, what's this? Consultation. <laughs> Coach, I, I'd like to, since you mentioned that, I'd like to, to take this opportunity. Um, I know you have an auction coming up to benefit the freelance coaches. Yes. And you, you, That's tomorrow night. I, I, I want to be fair also to the frontliners, and I know it's kind of fun, uh, your, your, your auction for that, but if I, I can give two sessions, one wow. session that will benefit, it's a one hour session. We can just, you know, whoever wins it can just schedule with me. 
Uh, I don't know if you want to do it an auction style or you want to give it as is. I leave it up to you. Um, the the word the the it's worth two thousand five hundred bucks. Okay, so per session. Per session, one That's, hour. One you know, hour. So you have an idea now. If you want yeah. to, if you want to have a, a session yeah. with Doc, that's how. That's our uh, premium. So, well, whoever wins the whoever wins the auction, it's, it's going to benefit. It's not going to benefit me. It's going to benefit um, our, our freelance coaches and and uh, and the frontliners. So yes, I, I uh, and and they can pass on the the benefit. The, yeah, if you want to pass it on, it's it's fine. Okay, so they can pass it to their player or to whoever they want to pass it to. Wow. Right. So yes. yeah. I've I've cool. never done that before, but uh, mm -hmm. this is for this is to raise, raise money for charity and it's for a good yes. cause. Uh, yeah. So. Yes, I'm just waiting on the artwork on the you know on uh, just waiting on uh, Blackwater, but I was able to give them the proceeds already. I'm just yeah. gonna post the artwork by tomorrow, but uh, we were able to raise three say sixty thousand sixty sixty three thousand. 50 pesos. That's uh, what we were able to raise uh, for the our, uh, first first um, first part of our auction. And, uh, you know, sorry to interrupt it, but the second part will be tomorrow night. So, again, we, I'll, I'll mention that after. So, let's go to the activity, Doc. All right. Next, next slide, Coach. I, I know everybody's waiting. So, if you guys have a sheet of paper, I mean, that's how it's normally done. You have a sheet of paper. Oh, so I'll give everyone uh, two minutes to get a sheet, sheet of paper and I'll... Dr. Teddy, uh, yeah, I'm going to go. ask for okay. some, some people that might be on the call. Yeah, yeah. Go. Will a notebook work, or should I tear that sheet of paper off? Um, um, that's a sheet. It's it's actually a really short exercise. Okay, cool. But you may oh. want to keep it in notebooks in the future if you want to use it. I'm using a board, I, Doc, I that I will auction up <laughs> also tomorrow. Whoa! Uh, beaten up board, but you know it's some perfect. great memories here. Game used. It's game used. Game board. use. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't know, Phoenix, uh, Dragons. Wow. Okay. So, some, uh, it's not guys, broken, uh, so it's probably most, mostly wins. <laughs> so, all right. Okay, now, okay, everyone who's uh, watching me on the webinar, um, be it, you know, our international audience or our participants here now. Uh, this is like a magic trick. Because okay. Once we do this now, you will, you know what I mean? You know what, you know, you know what the magic trick is. But it doesn't stop you from using the magic trick with, some, with, with your players. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. what were we talking about earlier um, in the last slide? What did you want to find out? The last slide was yeah. about... You wanted to find out about... How boost to boost their self-esteem. Self okay, so this is tailor-made for this particular activity. All right. Okay. I would, in, before I answer your question, I'll probably ask you to do this activity, and then I'll answer the the the, the previous question. Okay, so guys, can you write down the six people you spend the most time with? Mm. Okay. Now. Okay. Um, but, please, but, uh, Buti lang, pandemic, hindi, hindi mo yeah. na-name yung mga iba yung mga number to nila. For the sake of this exercise, you have to look at it pre-pandemic. So oh, oh, okay, okay, pre-pandemic. You're going to put your whole family there, it defeats the purpose of this, of this activity. Yes, so okay. this, is, this is a pre-pandemic activity. My mm -hmm. hope is that it can be used again in the future. That's always my hope. Okay. All right. Teddy, does it have to be six individual people or pwedeng iba groups of people? Uh, okay, no, that's great, uh, Ian. That's fine. You can you can work. You you see what I put here. You can modify this however you want. So if you feel it's a group or group of people like your close friends or in in the Philippines what we call the barcada, you know, you, that's fine. So we can you can do that. Mm -hmm. 
So when when uh, you guys are done with the si six groups of people or six people, mm -hmm. I guess if you're going to be it a group, maybe family is already considered one, so that you can put other groups. Mm -hmm. Everybody who asked the question in the Q and A, don't worry. We're gonna get we're gonna get to you guys. Okay. Uh, huh. Kind of. Okay. Um, I'm looking through some of the questions. Maybe while you're writing this, I can answer this now. Um, Dindo, uh, Patricia is asking me tips on how to debrief our athletes. Mm -hmm. Dindo, again, I need a specific situation. I cannot give an answer because that answer may not hold true uh, depending on the situation. I hope that makes sense. I cannot give a general answer. You, you have to be more specific with what I'm debriefing them on. So I'd, I'd be happy, I'm happy to answer that, but I need uh, you to expound on that a little bit more. Hmm. Pinairapan ako ni Ian. Nag-group ko tuloy yung mga friends. <laughs> Hindi tuloy ako. Pinairapan din sa tanong ko eh. Eh, I cannot now name six because I put friends, okay. players. Mark Herrera is done. What? Uh -huh. If it helps, I think we're done. Okay. Uh, uh, si Coach, uh, si Coach uh, I, I'm not yet done, but uh, I'll, you know, the, I have four. Yeah, finish it. Finish it. It's important. Let's finish yeah. it. Okay. Then, I, uh, uh, uh huh. Hmm. Okay. Okay. All right, um, and uh, who else? One more. I got. I need one more. Miguel, I'll answer one question while uh, we're waiting for that because some other some of our other uh, okay. have to be done. So uh, this is this is one of the questions here in the Q and A. Um, uh, I'll, I'll have to say it in English because we have an international audience, guys. Okay. So All right. You're asking, doctor, um, how big of a role that the sports psychologists have with players who have experienced in the inju injuries. The ones who have come back to the game, but they did, they, they did not meet the expectations of their previous performance. So they're not the same kind of player that they were before. And the, the example here uh, that they gave is Derek Rose during his time with the Bulls. Now, Derek Rose is the youngest MVP ever. I think, right? Or did Giannis already beat him? Um, uh, as far as I know, Derek Rose is the youngest, if not one of the youngest MVPs at 23 years old. He had a very promising career in front of him. Um, as a first seed against an eighth seed, um, Philadelphia 76ers, with the game well in hand, he drove and he, he tore his ACL. Um, usually it takes... Uh, a year to come back from that injury. He was ex he was cautious. Uh, he missed the entire season. He came back. I think there was a meniscus tear in I think the other knee. Tapos he came back. So that's the doing injuries, yeah. And um, coming, there's two ways to look at the Derrick Rose situation. Are you looking at it from the perspective of you ask for the perspective of a sports psychologist? The answer is. Only the player can know when they're ready to come back. That's the you cannot you cannot force somebody to come back before they're ready. Because that's how injuries happen. That's that's I think what did um, that's what uh, did. Uh, of course, nobody could ever predict it, but I think that's what did uh, Kevin Durant in. That's what that's what led to him tearing his uh, Achilles. 
he came back. He came, you know, the, the stakes were high. His team, his team was on the fence, and and he came back prematurely. All of all of the medical people of Kevin Durant said he's going to be okay. But see, there's still that percentage that you're not going to be okay. So remember what I said earlier, guys. Tolerance of risk. Who do you trust? Who do you put your career or your hands in? That's why my answer for this question is only Derek Rose would know. Now, the reason why he got so much flack for him, he was the designated player of his team. He was getting, what, 25 30% of the cap room. They can't sign anybody else because he's on their team. So His injury was very unfortunate. I don't think he wanted to get hurt. It's just these things happen. But I'm happy he's having a resurgence with... Uh, I think Minnesota, he played really well. And then now with Detroit. So I'm happy for him. Oh, Eddie, uh, Mark Barrera has a question. Uh, okay. Do the six people he listed uh, have to be in order? No. No. The, you just take the you just take it. If you want to put it for order of importance, that's, that's your prerogative. But uh, just write the six groups or six people. So I think you, I gave you guys enough time already. Okay, can we go to the next the next slide? I'm ready. Go. This exercise has little to do with the people you're spending time, but has everything to do with where you're going and what you're doing with your life. To successfully change your future, you need to change the way you think, which may mean that you will have to, to think wisely about the people you spend your time with. Choose to spend time with people who understand and appreciate and share your, your personal vision and goals. As he talked about that earlier, you know, um, he wants to spend time. For those of you who attended, uh, this is our guest earlier. Uh, it's a current, current former MVP and uh, current PBA player, Asi Taolava. He, um, he shared that he doesn't, at this stage of his career, he wants to be around teammates that can help him excel more. And then he has like two teammates that um, shoot around early and he shoots around with them so that he can get his shots in before the actual practice. So when you write down your, your when you look at the, the people that you put in, that's why I mentioned it had to be pre-COVID. Are there any people there or in those groups of circle, I'm not saying that they're bad people, that get you further away from where you need to go. Now again, I'm reiterating, I'm not saying that they're bad people, but if there are some people on that list that they're not helping you be the best version of who you can possibly be, maybe it's time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's so this activity stresses that. Now, mm -hmm. if you go back to our, of our if you go back uh, two slides to the self. Now, where does self esteem fit in here? So after I give that activity, now we're going to talk about self esteem. If you're around people who keep who, who continually put you down, how can your self-esteem, self-worth, and, and ultimately your self-confidence, how can it improve? Right? So surround yourself with like-minded people. Surround yourself with people who have your best interests at heart. A, 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 a person who tells Derek Rose, you must go back to the court immediately. It's on the top. I don't know whose best interests at heart. Right? So, all right. So, yeah. Coach, next slide when you're ready. All right. That's it? That's the activity? That's the activity. Wow. Activities, guys, Good. activities don't have to be long. But you have mm -hmm. it has to be able to hit its mark. Stress so we, Yeah. So we have to we, we can do that with our players. Sure. The thing is, I hope some of the players are not watching this right now. <laughs> it takes away from the activity. Again, you can only use it once, use it wisely. All right. Okay. How can we develop the mental toughness of an athlete? Again, now whoever asks you this question, you you have to give me the specific instance because it changes uh, my answer will change depending on the situation but uh, generally uh, for mental toughness again it's putting it's it's putting yourself in in a position to want to be better 
So again, like the, the, the examples of Coach Nick or, or Coach Jeffrey Carriasso regarding, you know, imagining yourself that you're taking, you're, you're taking a foul shot and you're going to, you know, you're making it or making that cross-court pass. It's going to help overall when you're in an actual situation, a make or break situation. In psychology, there, um, there is a term called fight or flight. Fight means you're going to stand up and face the problem, and flight means you're going to run far, far away from it. Okay, so the only way you can stand up and face it is if you've faced it multiple times. That's why, you know, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of activities that, that are, are shorter in nature, and then you can do it all over again. So I, I mentioned that earlier. That's why I like, I really truly like the game of basketball because, you know, once the game's over, there's a winner, scores back to zero, you can do it again. But did you learn from that last game? And are you able to make the proper, uh, uh, the, the proper uh, adjustment? Okay, so that's my general answer for mental toughness. I hope the coach who sent me in this question is here. Maybe you can give me the specific example and I'd be very happy to give my uh, uh, comments on that. Go to your All right. On the subject of mental toughness, how can we change the mindset of the team from bowing down to the alpha or striving to be the alpha without disrupting team chemistry? Most especially with kids below 12. Okay, um, I'm very happy when the youth coaches ask me questions. Um, because, uh, I don't want to ever, anybody to ever think that's only, I'm only looking at the professional or amateur level. I'm, I'm very happy to look at it as well from developmental level. Um, and and now, if we're, now, this is a specific example. And in this particular example, if I'm going to look at it, before we can get to the players, we need to know what the foundation is. You can't build the building if mm -hmm. you're, you're building it on the ground that's not, so, you know, that's earthquake prone or, you know, you, you understand what I'm saying? It's, it's, uh, it can't sustain the building. So there's, there's for, for your players to, to, for there to be an alpha, it, is, it falls on the shoulders of the, of the coach to set what the rules, the, the rules are for the team moving forward. If you understand that this player is an alpha, maybe that's something that you need to talk to with that particular player. Get, you know, getting uh, the player to buy in. As, as Coach Nash said, it takes time. Coach Nash Sasella was our guest uh, earlier this, this evening. And he said, uh, for players to buy in, it takes time. And I, I completely agree. So you, coach, um, the one who wrote me this question, you have to talk to your alpha first, because if you're going to do it retroactively, once you guys are practicing already and you let them out there, it's, it's, it's going to be harder. Um, I, me, uh, well, when I run camps, not specifically basketball camps, but when I run camps with kids, I always have ground rules. And my number one ground rule is the fault of one is the fault of all. Why? Because if something goes wrong, then we have nothing else to talk about anymore. I mean, my camps, the camps I ran were short. I have four days for, for people who have never, most of them have never met each other. You know, we have to do many activities. And by the end, you know, we have to have a program for the parents when they come in. That's it's hard, so you have to lay down the foundational work already. So coaches, you have to come up with what are your ground rules? And then from there, um, you'll, be able, you'll be able to address this issue because before it reaches this point, we're in uh, the other players are bowing to the, uh, the alpha. It's very hard. Basketball is a game, it's a team sport. It involves five players. It's very hard if you know, you know where the offense is coming from. Uh, there, team chemistry, I, I guess, is also, again, um, taking a page from Coach Nash, you know, it depends on your, person, uh, your, your personnel and it depends on, your, on what your, your team concepts are. 
And then from there, you can build your team chemistry. All right. Thank you. Uh, one last example. Um, you know, if you've noticed um, players like Dennis Rodman or, or Isaiah Ryder, you know, they've had the history. It, this has been chronicle. They've had the history wherein uh, teams have had a hard time uh, dealing with them. But because of their exceptional talent, you know, they've always found jobs. But if you notice, at the turn of the century, exactly around 99, 2000, all of a sudden there was no roster space anymore for players like Rodman or Isaiah Ryder. Now, why is that? Was that was that? It might not have even been. Uh, it might have been just you know numbers. You know, they had gotten older. But I I, I see the NBA now that they're not as understanding anymore of of of. Uh, of very flamboyant or, or players who are outside of the norm. Unless you're, of course, a very exceptional talent. But now, now people, they usually have to conform to what the, what the team chemistry, the team culture is. If not, it's, uh, they may not last long with the team. Mm -hmm. Next question, Coach. Wow, this is a long one. Yeah, as I, I promised, I said I will put everything down. This was a question also. Uh, Emerito, can you read this out? Emerito. I am not seeing it, Coach. Oh, you're not seeing it? Uh, is everybody seeing this? Uh, Ian? Oh, Ian, yeah, can, got... can you read for me? Okay, so my primary focus is on character. How do you feel we are doing now since the incident of violence that happened in the Gilas game versus Australia? Did we do the proper training after those incidents? Overall, have we made a good assessment and correction of bad behavior? I have seen considerable violence here in games at the youth and college levels. It appears it is taught by the coaches and even encouraging games. How can you rectify this from a psychological standpoint? And I have talked this over with several coaches and feel we need to incorporate character development with the players but also more sports psychology and character training with coaches and accountability control with the coaches. We need licensing at all levels and more regional oversight committees to remove coaches that cross the line, especially at the 18 and... Coach, pangat yung slide? Sorry. 18 and under levels, would you agree? That's, uh, that's the last part. This is a really, this is a lot of questions. It's a really loaded question. I think it's Emerito who asked this question. <laughs> I don't know. I, I purposely did not look at who asked it. Okay. So, um, I, I, I don't I, think I asked this question. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, um, first thing is, um, it's improper for me to comment, especially if I'm, especially since I'm not part of this team, this, this Gila's team against Australia, uh, it, 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 it's, it's highly irregular for me to comment on that. Uh, I was not there. I was not in the team huddle. I, as I mentioned, I drew earlier the bell curve. If you guys remember, something happened. Mm -hmm. So there. Now, now, this coach has seen a lot of violence happen and uh, feels there's a need. I think uh, what, what coach is asking is if there's a need for anger management. Now, if they, if they need something on anger management, I do that as well. That's all. But in terms of me commenting about the removal of coaches, that's not, that's not in, in my, uh, that's not for me to say. So, in, in, you know, in our country, it's a free country, we're entitled to opinion. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it would really depend on what the coaching bodies feel about that. But as for me, I, I have no comment on that because I was not part of this particular situation. Mm -hmm. Next question, Coach. Okay. Uh, Ian, ask the question. So, Okay, question number 27. How do you reinforce mental toughness through a losing streak when it starts impacting players' morale and performance? Okay, um... Okay, uh, when you're looking at the season, 
So let's look at it from an NBA season. Okay, you have uh, 82 games, and you're losing. So Ian, like, give me how many games have we lost so far? Games. Team X, Team X has lost how many games? Uh, ten. Ten okay. game losing streak. Ten game. What's my what's uh, what's the overall record now of the team? Overall, it's now uh, twenty wins and thirty losses. Okay, so we played fifty. We played uh, fifty games. That would leave us with uh, thirty-two games. Can you think? You think we can still make the playoffs? Uh, if you're in the East, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're true. so bad. That's true, no, but that is so true. Okay, so why am I why am I adding this? This gives you guys at least an idea of how I'm going to approach it, because. The question as us alone, it won't give. It's like I gave you the dish, but there's no flavoring, there's no seasoning. Does that make sense? That's why I'm asking it to, you know, for us to to put the little uh, elements into it, so it, it gains a foundation. Now, there it is a. We are in the Western Conference, and there's probably very little chance that we're going to make it. So what are we? What are we going to shoot for? What's our record again? Twenty thirty. Okay, our next game is zero zero. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that I want the players to look at. It's zero zero, and we're gonna take it. We're gonna take it uh, a quarter. We're gonna look. We're gonna try to win quarters. And Coach Ariel knows this. This is this mm -hmm. is my philosophy. I've never changed it in all the years that he's known me. We're gonna look at quarters, and if we win quarters, if you add it up, we win games. So we're trying, if you we're only going to look at the quarters. If we had a bad quarter, don't focus on that, just focus on the next quarter. Okay, if we're going to add another layer to it. I, I, I think if I'm 20, 30, I have young players. So I'm going to give my young players, of course, that's not for me to decide. But let's assume I'm already, I'm already in a position that I will suggest, <laughs> coach. I will suggest to the head coach that they, you know, they might want to give their younger players. An opportunity since it's a long season, because you cannot replicate you cannot re replicate uh, game action eh, no matter how much you practice. So that would be my recommendations, and we'll try to we'll make it like we're down twenty. If there's an opportunity to have and you have the ball, if there's an opportunity to advance the ball and and, and try out an, an out of timeout play, if the other coach will have nothing against it, you know, do it because it's an actual game situation. So you, you, you try to look at the areas we're in. You, you can look for a positive. You can, you can find a win. Because if you can, you can find a small win, you can build on it. And I feel it'll be able to, to reinforce the overall mental toughness. Because that's not only one moment. It's many moments brought together. So thanks for helping coloring up that, uh, <laughs> that thing, uh, that question. Question 28. Uh, yep. Okay, so um, this is very similar to um, to the Derek Rose question I asked earlier while everybody was filling it out. But um, if a player is coming back from a major injury, how do we help the person bounce back and remove or alleviate the fear of re injury? Now, do you guys all remember Jason Kidd? Coaches? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jason Kidd. I'm not quite sure if you guys remember. But... The coach or the player? No, no, no sorry. Uh, uh, when I, Jason Kidd, the player. Okay. Like chess, I'm asking, <laughs> I'm asking, so at least I'm talking to somebody, right? I'm not talking only to myself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Jason Kidd, the player, had microfracture knee surgery. You guys okay. remember that? Okay, so microfracture knee surgery is you drill in small holes into the affected area and then supposed to promote healing. That's pretty much the extent of what I know with that. Now, it can make or break a career. Now, when Kid was, uh, came back from that, he was favoring his other knee and he was forced to have surgery on, on let's say it's his left knee. He, he had to have surgery on his right knee because he was uh, overcompensating with his other knee. You know, he hardly mm -hmm. missed. This is the time when uh, players were playing through injuries. They're, they were real gladiators at that time. Wala pa yung, load management. No more, there wasn't, there, 
that was a that was a foreign word at that time. Uh, but you know, sports science has gotten to the point na there how much time a player is spending now in practice, how much time they're spending in the court. They they they, they have data already that supports the load management. So you know, don't expect. You know, this is out of the topic, but just don't expect the all-time records to fall. I mean, LeBron will probably be the last one to break records. These other players won't play enough games to to break the records, the all-time records. But now going back to this with the injury again, as I said earlier, only a player can know when they're ready. But as mm -hmm. a staff or as a sports psychologist, what can we do? Uh, uh, the rehab, the rehab uh, specialists or the sports psychologists, what can we do? we can uh, hopefully get the player to the point where they are more confident that they will not, they're not afraid that they're gonna get hurt. So it takes time. That's the reason why, um, you know, this like for, for ACL, there's a certain rehab time, you know, they, they're gonna make them play what? Uh, one, um, three, um, not even five and five, you know, they're playing against no defense. They're just running with the team. You know, they, they build them up to the point that they're confident, they're in game shape, and they're confident that, that they can get back on, on, onto the court. So that's one way. Telling a player that, you know, you've, you know, we're paying you a lot of money and you have to come back immediately, that's not going to help. You have to look at the big, big, the big picture. And the big picture is um, the, that person's future. Not, not only as a basketball player, but as a human being. So that's how you have to look at it. Because basketball is only, only a small part of a person's life. They have the rest of their life. Okay. Next question. All right. There. Um, well, again, um, this is a bit tough because... Um, now, when you say scouting, are we scouting before they're drafted to the teams? Or are we scouting that they're ready? Mm. Part of the team? I don't know. It uh, it's maybe scouting for potential. So not not uh, not yet in the team. Because you won't have you don't really have any access to, to the other players yet. I mean, especially if you're with the team full time. I mean, you won't have access to the other players. I mean, you may know. You may know, uh, you can talk to other people who know the person, but you don't need a sports psychologist for that. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's what you call vetting. You know, uh, vetting is like, you know, they're, they're, the, the, the teams will do background checks on, on players at some form or at some form or at, at any level, especially the higher it goes. There, there's that, you know, they, they, they find, you know, you hear about it all the time. Like uh, this team interviewed the high school coach. They want to know what kind of player, how, how well is does he work with others? You know, you can have the most talented player, but if it doesn't check all of your boxes, then then maybe that's not the best player for you. You know, so there you go. All right. Yeah. How the how can a coach help a player who experiences a slump? Okay, um, Hugh, Hubie Brown said it best so this is the this is the the knowledge of a of a, of a highly respected coach and uh and um i'm going to share it with you guys i mean ub brown has all of these little post-its and notes when he does a game and if i i have never really dreamed of shadowing a coach but if there's one coach i'd want to shadow it's him i want to see how he does his uh play by play uh, not play by play. He's an analyst. His role as an analyst, and and you know, pick his brain for an hour. That that would be really great. And what tambak na yung game? There's really no reason to watch. That shows where somebody like Hubie Brown comes in because they're going to give. They're going. They might give a nugget or two that will educate the listeners. And what does the nugget give? He mentioned a player who was clearly struggling. What does a player have to do? He cannot continually shoot. From the outside, because obviously that's mm -hmm. not working, right? So what does a player do? A player has to way to manufacture easy points. They have to get to the foul line, because in the foul line, the only person against you is yourself. 
if you see the ball go through the hoop, through the net, you're experiencing some measure of success and you can build on that. So that's what I would suggest. You know, let's, if, if the outside shot is not working, let's try something else. Let's try to drop a play to get them uh, an, an alley-oop or, or something close to the basket so that they can start to build their confidence. Next question. How can the, how can the coach help the player bounce back? Uh, it's not quite clear what the situation is. It could be any situation. Uh, but, after uh, losing a game. Okay. So oh, okay. Uh, then, okay. So if you're going to work on how I, I, I explained it earlier, I, I'm, I'm really all for it being a clean slate in the next game. So you were like, what, 9 out of 35? Were your shots, were, I would focus on the positive, were your shots within the continuity of the offense? Did you force shots? If it was within the continuity of the offense, it didn't go in, then, you know, guys, that's, that's how the basketball bounces. You can't have the, the best game always. So ask, if I'm looking at it from the lens of a coach, that's how I would do it. Or that's what, how I would suggest it for a coach to handle it. Or if I'm part of the team, that's how you know the coach will most likely ask me to have to deal with him. True, George Mum Mumford, Phil Jackson ex exposed mindfulness, and there is a Dutch Iceman, Wim Hof, on the breathing exercises. Are there similar Filipino practitioners? who we can refer to? Um, Bill Jackson was really big on uh, Native American history. You know, he was collecting all of the artifacts and he has certain beliefs that come with that. It also, see, you know, he was also into Zen, meaning to say is he was already a practitioner to begin with and he was also well-connected. Mumford uh, is, you know, he does more of the mindfulness exercises for Phil Jackson. He, he invited him for, to work with the Bulls. Now, why am I giving you guys this background information? Because if you're going to invite somebody to do breathing exercises with your team, and that's not something that he espouses or, or he does on a regular basis, it's kind of hard to teach it to other people. Let's take a page from, from uh, Coach Tim when he said, don't teach something that you don't know. So, if you're looking for a practitioner who does it, ask if it's something that they really do. How often do they, do they, do they do it? Have they, have they done it with large groups? What, what kind of success, if any, has, has been measured? These are additional questions you need to ask. Okay, so um, the reason why Phil Jackson was into, into it, because he was doing it. If you guys have been watching The Last Dance, there was one clip there where he, where he gets the... the the, 90, the 97, 98 bulls in a huddle and then their, their shoes are off, they're in a circle and they're doing breathing exercises. It seems like he was the one leading that. I mean, you can't, it doesn't hurt. It was at that time, probably he was starting it in, in the early 90s when they were winning or, or even before they were winning. People may have thought that's strange, but winning cures everything. It makes the unconventional conventional. So to answer this question, if you guys are planning on getting uh, somebody to help you with this or if you plan on doing it as a coach, you have to believe in it first. There's no point in asking your players to do it if you yourself are not willing to do it in the first place. Next question. Uh, Emerito, I got a man. I think hey, Emerito... Question number 33. Coming from Sam Hinkie's failure to integrate psychological strengths with analytical data in his the process. How can a team improve its scouting approach in the era of big data in sports? Uh, okay. See, <laughs> Tanking to the Top. <laughs> okay, so uh, Tanking to the Top is a book which, uh, you know, full disclosure, everybody, I have not had a chance to read it. And uh, I don't Interesting, know if huh? not asking me from the, from the perspective of a sports psychologist or just it's asking me, I, I think, as, as an individual, as a person, as a fan. 
And if I'm going to answer, I can only answer it as a fan because I, I, have, I have no inner, inner knowledge of how they do their, uh, their scouting. But if you look at the process for what it was, it, it attempted to game the system, the, the lottery system, wherein if you're, a bot, if you're one of the lower ranking teams, you have an increased odds of, uh, of, 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 of garnering the top three picks or the top pick. The low, if, you're, if the worst record back in the day, uh, the lowest that you can go is fourth. That's how it was back in the day. Now, now the NBA has smoothed the odds. I think every top, top three worst teams have the same odds now. So the process as it was originally done is no more. So, but back in the day, the only way you can, you can measure if a process works or not is by the success of your draft picks. And I, I took the years where Hinky, uh, Hinky was there, and that's essentially 2013 to 2015. He got the draft pick that eventually became Ben Simmons, but that was the call of uh, Brian Colangelo, who's no longer with that team. He got no Nerlens Noel, who I think was injured for the year. He drafted uh, Michael Carter Williams, who won the Roy for that year. So that's a pretty successful draft. The following year, they drafted Embiid, who didn't play for the whole year. Then they got Sarek, who was also a very serviceable player. Then the following year, they, get, they got Okafor, who, you know, at least for his time there, he was okay. But the key element here is, I don't know if it's part of their, their analytics, they found Covington and McConnell, TJ McConnell. They signed into these crazy long-term deals for a low amount of salary, and they turned out to be rotational players for them. So... I guess this is my long-winded answer saying, I think, I think, I feel that the process worked given its time. Plus, in terms of a marketing perspective, they branded it with, um, you know, trust the process, which, which everybody in Philadelphia bought into and management bought into it. And if management buys into it, then, you know, your job is safe. Well, it was safe until they fired them. So, so that's my answer for this one, Coach. All right. Um, I'd like to shout out to uh, Lee Tahunera. He's uh, also a um, practicing uh, uh, sports psychology. So somebody asked earlier, um, uh, who who does uh, this uh, um, session also? So he's also a, a practitioner. Again, next question. Um, uh, Emirito, fire right. away. Question 34. How do you think should I approach a player, assistant coach, or anyone on staff that is outwardly agreeing with everything you're saying, but is doing the opposite, and it's obviously a will issue? Do I reprimand that person, or are there any possible underlying psychological causes that might, I might have overlooked? Uh, well, I wouldn't go as far as a psycho addressing it as a psychological cause, but Clearly, I mean, if you're going to use a psychological term for it, uh, this, this uh, player, assistant coach, or anyone on the staff is passive-aggressive, meaning you know, they're, they're saying something, but they're doing the exact opposite, exact opposite thing. Now, again, what is my number one rule with you guys? Honesty. Not, no, you, let's not go to the point that you're reprimanding, but maybe you need to be very upfront with this person. Tell them, you know, role, role identification is also very important. Hopefully, it was done. Because if they know their role, then things become easy. If they know their role, they know their expectations, things become easier. If you, if you listen to our coaches, you know, you know, some of the brightest minds, you know, they, at one point or another, have emphasized this. You know, they, they like to empower. But they've used different words. They want to empower. They have to trust, you know. Because uh, the head coach cannot, be, they cannot do everything. It's too many, there are too many personalities. There's too many variables in play. You know, they won't sleep anymore if they have to handle all of this. So I guess it goes down to, um, to definition of rules, at least. And if a person is, if the player, if the assistant or the staff is comfortable with it, and if they're not, then, you know, maybe it's time to go our separate ways, right? Maybe it's something we can talk about. I don't know. It's different. Uh, if if we add more color to this question, then my answer may change. But based on this, that's how I'd answer it. 
35. All right. We're almost done. It's 38 questions, and I have 13. Since our senior high school can't offer sports uh, scholarship or discount, how can I effectively motiv motivate student athletes who are becoming lazy and attending practice or exercising? One of our uh, webinar, our web, the webinars, if you guys have been attending all of it, I, I, I have learned so much. And what, what I learned from um, one of our one of our speakers is, I'm trying to remember, um, but he handled, it was one of our earlier speakers, he's Coach Ariel, he's our youngest coach. Is that Coach Preston? Mm, yeah. Okay, so. Um, Spradling. I hope, I hope, uh, Coach Preston, I hope this is you, because I'm, credit, I'm, credit, I'm crediting this to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, you, if it comes to recruit, recruiting players, you have to sell with the education that it has to be something beyond basketball. Um, that, that, that the education that you will get from the college or the university will be something that they can build on and something that they can use for the rest of their life. That is the approach that I would take. And that uh, for me, I would be very honest with the player. Like, you know, you coming here doesn't mean that you're going to be the star player. You, you'll have to earn your spot. And a lot of our, our, our guest coaches have, have echoed the same thing. You have to earn it. I think now, if you dis despite you being very honest and straight uh, straightforward and, and giving that, if they if they if they decide not to choose your program, that is entirely their prerogative. The most you can do is give your best pitch. Then they have to make the decision. You can't force somebody to make uh, such a life changing decision as this. Uh huh. What team building activities are more effective, most effective for team sports? They had, I learned this from coach, one of Coach Ariel's teams. I had finished an activity and all the players came to me and said, so tell mm -hmm. me which one of us won. <laughs> and then I was trying to explain to them that there was no winner and that was not the objective of the exercise. And we had, we had taken a break for lunch and some of them had come to me and said, so now that you know my my other my other my opposition's gone, tell me the truth. Who won? So the one thing I learned with team building activities is, especially at the pro level, each activity must always have a winner, and those will be the most effective ones because they'll be the most they'll be the the most engaged when it comes to that. Next question. What must a coach do when he has a bullied player in the team? How does he handle the situation? Note, this player is an all-around player in the game. Ah. So. Probably one of the Good best. Question, though. Yeah. Good question. Uh, probably one of the, I would assume, it's one of your better players. Now, um, it, I don't have all the variables. I, uh, you know, the subject of bullying, bullying prevention is a subject that's very close and dear to my heart. I wrote my master thesis on, on the definition of, of bullying in the Philippines. So uh, um, given, given that whenever I'm faced with cases like this, you know, it always, uh, I give it more than an extra attention. Now, there's a lot of variables that we, we can't speak of here. Who is the one bullying them? Is it the teammates? Is it out of the team? It, it's a very hard question to answer. So, uh, Coach, if you are here mm -hmm. and you ask this question, kindly put it in the Q and A. Give me more. Uh, give me more. Uh, give me more to work with with this, because I don't want to cheapen the answer for this. Uh, you know, I, I, I. You don't have to give me names. Just, just give me the more of an overview of how this works. Coach, next question, please. All right. Oh, How do you debrief? I think you've answered. Right, right. Um, again, I, I need to know what the context is. What happened? Why am I debriefing them? Mm -hmm. you know, for, I'll give an example. Um, Gilas, the Gilas team fought the Australian team. That involves debriefing. You know, 
and 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 then just you know to give you an idea what the parameters of that would be is what's everybody's take on it because everybody sees the situation differently and then we have the do's and don'ts what we're not supposed to do and then finally what can we do to improve ourselves so that in the future if faced with a, a, a similar situation that we can be the better person and walk away from it right? so coach if you're here the one who asked me this question Please write in the Q&A so I can give a more thorough. So something that's more personal for you since you don't want to ask this question. Well, that's the last question. Right. Um, but uh, we have plenty of questions. Um, <laughs> uh, Tom of uh, International Ball is with us. Tom, uh, can, uh, can you speak? Tom? I think he's... Uh, yeah. Might be, uh, but his question is: Do you agree with the breakdown of game, uh, of game of basketball being ninety percent mental and ten percent physical ratio? Why? That's um, uh, Tom's question. Okay. Um, a lot of coaches have espoused this. They believe in it, uh, and at least for me, in, uh, if we're talking about it from from muscle memory. And, and visualizing and seeing yourself succeed, then my answer is yes. But um, you know, in that ten percent, that's also the God-given talent. Let's not forget the God-given talent. There, <laughs> that's uh, that that's really important. That's that's something that uh, I have one more slide after this, coach. Yes. Yeah, I think that's the one with the oops. Oops. Before this, yeah. There. So these are um, if you guys have questions for me, you know, I, I'm like you guys, I'm at home most of the time. It's not all the time. So um, questions for me that I can answer, you know, you can, these are some ways of how you can get in touch with me. Um, you can, you can email me or you can get through the Facebook messenger of my, the Facebook page. Uh, I, I asked the question in, and if you guys are going to email me, I, I, I'm thinking of starting a Substack, which is like an email newsletter. I'd like to know what topics you guys would like me to talk about or how often you'd want it. And the two options I gave is like twice a week or once a month. Anchor is, uh, is my podcast. Uh, my most recent podcast is with Coach Ariel. So that was, uh, Coach, thanks for that. That was uh, very educational. So, All right. Yeah, You're welcome. How, that's how to answer Tom's question. My answer is yes. Yes, there's uh, uh, 10 more questions in the Q&A. Uh, Ian, can you help me with the questions? Okay, so uh, one of the questions is, um, who in your honest opinion is the best motivational coach in the NBA and EBA over the years? Um, I'll be honest with you. I have not kept abreast with who are our current coaches in the PBA. Okay, so that's my disclaimer with the NBA. You know, back in the day, they would stay long in their position. Now, they're lucky to get a couple of years. So, but, you know, in terms of, mot in terms of motivation, you know, I, I'm, if you guys read into the questions I'm asking our international coaches who come onto the podcast, there's always a purpose why I asked the question, like if they've worked with, with Coach Popovich or if they've spent time with, with um, Coach Chuck Daly, you know, or if they have a Phil Jackson or a Tex Winter story. The reason why I asked this is that's my way of knowing the answer to that question. Because simply what we are watching on television is only but a, 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 a speck of what's actually happening during the times that we don't see them. We cannot solely gauge motivation on winning. Sadly, that's always going to be the barometer for the game of basketball, but you cannot only base it on that. That's why when I was, uh, when Coach John Uchiko was on, uh, for those of you who are listening, I asked him, I said, Coach, you know, I'd really like to know what uh, Coach Ron Jacob did with that team in the late 80s with, you know, several players who were in the latter part of their career because they were winning. And these are players that, you know, they, you know, when with their former teams, they had, you know, they had the falling out and they, 
Coach Ron was able to do something, and you know, I, I, I can't ask Coach Ron that because he's no longer with us. But so I asked him. I did the next best thing. I asked Coach John. So, I guess given more exposure to the coaches, I'd be able to to answer that. But off the top of my head, you know, of course, you know, uh, Popov, Greg Popovich, uh, you know, uh, um, Phil, of course, Phil Jackson. That's that's you know, you you have to give the assistant coaches also. Uh, some credit. You don't know what what they're doing behind the scenes. It's like when Larry Bird was the head coach, he was head coach by name. His def- his offensive coordinator was Rick Carlisle. You know, mm-hmm. then then uh, I, I forget yeah. who the defensive coach was. But you, you see, um, if if he wasn't doing the offense and the defense, what was what was Larry Bird doing? I guess he was motivating. So, you know. Um, the same goes a lot for a lot of PBA coaches. I feel like if you're if you're able to stay in the job, especially for a prolonged uh, period of time for a number of years, it's not solely X's and O's. From a motivational standpoint, you would have had to do something right as well. So, I know it's not the kind of answer that uh, our our participant was expecting, but that's how I answer it. I think Dan Burke was the 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 defensive coach of Larry Bird, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Because I I uh, I met him when I was in he's still in the uh, one of the assistant coaches in Indiana Pacers with the Pacers. Okay, Ian, shoot. Okay, so we have a question from Mark Barrera. How will you handle a player such as Delonte West? Okay, guys. Um, this is a very good question. Now, Delonte West has uh, has bipolar disorder. Okay. Now, um, if you've read the reports of him, like you know, the Cavs plane is about to take off, and he, he he had a panic attack or something happened on the plane, but he was he was he had to be removed from the plane or had they had to ground the flight. They couldn't fly out because they have to fly out together as a team. And um, you know. Uh, large, you know, he had a long playing career, considering all of the mental health challenges that he had to go through during a time when it wasn't as uh, players weren't as open as they are about it now. He had a long playing career, but what 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 one has to understand is um, every day for a person who has uh, who is struggling with bipolar disorder, it's uh, you're making timpla. It's like making. It's like when you're you're trying to accelerate in the car. If you if you're learning how to drive, you know it's not a smooth drive. You know you're going like that. It's not. It's not. So every day, it's it's a matter of managing the managing the moods. Uh, are they having a good day today? Is it a not so good day? Uh, what can they do? Uh, when it's within their power to get out of it. You know, uh, in my work as a counseling psychologist, I deal with that usually on a daily basis. I have a lot of cases along those lines. And uh, there's a lot of uh, things that I don't know about Delonte's case, but I, I sure hope that he's getting the help that he needs and the medication that he needs. Thank All you, Mark, right. for, that, for that question. That was a very good question. Okay, there's a couple more questions. Okay, so from an anonymous uh, attendee, he, he's asking, if I see a sports psychologist, doesn't that indicate that I am mentally weak? Okay. So um, remember my picture at the start? I, I showed the men in black, right? Nobody has to know that you saw me, that you consulted me. That's Now, if, if, if that player was going to post it on their social media, then there's nothing I can do about it. But certainly, it's not going to come from me that anybody's going to know about it. As you, as you can see, I've also been very discreet with, with uh, talking about uh, the case, the, the teams that I've, I've been with or the players that I've handled. Now, seeing, actually, I, I, it's the opposite. I see it as a sign of strength that you have identified that there is a concern that you need to work on and that you are strong enough to seek the help for it. Players like that shouldn't be looked down upon. They should, they should be... You know, they should be embraced. Next All right. Uh, Emirito, ask your question. 
my question. Um, I already asked my question earlier, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I would just uh, most likely uh, ask Coach Ted, uh, Doc Teddy, to talk about uh, flow a little bit more uh, because I think that's something that uh, he yeah. he he's very um, well versed in. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about it here, but uh, that's something that I'm really... Coach, Coach uh, Bong, I'll be honest with you. We can go on the whole night if I talk about that. Can I leave it as the last one? Just well, one? yeah, I, I was actually thinking if... Because uh, I, I know you can do a whole segment on it. So I don't know if you, you well, want to ask the whole... I can give the short. The short of okay. it is... is um, right. There is a book by... Uh, um, I, I cannot even pronounce the name of the author because it, it's so long. It begins with, yeah, I think during one of the talks I, I posted it and, and um, maybe during our next webinar or, or I will put, I'll post the book on the who, if it's okay with Coach Ariel, yeah, post. Coach's uh, international web page on, on the flow. It's, it's one of our required readings in San Diego. We had an entire one semester on it. Okay. The, uh, and the basis of that was that book. So if you read that book, it's like you already went for one semester in San Diego already. Now, the, 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 five, the, the elevator picture of the book essentially is that the flow is something that each, we as, co as coaches or you know, even if you're not playing anymore now or as players, once upon a time, we have played the game of basketball. And we have had a game where in every shot that we threw up, went in, or you have never made, you know, little to no mistake, it is just flowing, it was the perfect game. It was so perfect for you that you can't forget it, no matter how many years have already passed. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've experienced something like that, uh, and I can't, forget, I can't forget that experience. So what the book says, and I hope I can remember, it's been a couple of years since I read it, but the book essentially says that there is no way that you can attain, that you can will, you can will the, the flow to come, but you can be mentally prepared and, and physically prepared so that when the, when the opportunity does come and you catch the proverbial wave, you'll be able to ride it. So what are good examples? Clay Thompson's 37-point uh, third quarter, where in everything that he threw up went in. Maybe the game where uh, Steph broke the record for most three-pointers in one game. Bong Alvarez's 71-point game, which I think he did without uh, three-pointer. Alan Kaidik's 79-point game and 68-point game. The 79-point game of Alan, if I remember correctly, he... I don't think he played the first quarter. He did that in three quarters and he shot 17 out of 19 from, from distance. That's a flow game. And I think recently he, he played out of town. He scored 100, 100 something points in one game. So, you know, I think the person to talk to about flow would be uh, Coach Alan Kaidik, <laughs> who's experienced it so much in his career. All right. Like what I said, I think we, I think that's something for for another day. All right. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we got uh, last three questions before we wrap it up. Um, uh, what about the Grant Hill case? Okay, I, I, could we kindly go back to question twenty eight? I'm sorry, we had so many, and uh, I might get the question wrong. It, I, it might have to do with the rushing a player back from injury. There. Yeah. Okay. Now, guys, you, you, for, to answer the Grant Hill... Oh, Santi, thank you for that question. To answer the Grant Hill uh, situation, you have to know the history of Grant Hill. And, and, and Grant Hill, when he was in Detroit, they were injecting him uh, with uh, painkillers and whatnot so that he would play in that playoff series against... I, I can't remember if it was Atlanta. I can't remember who the opponent was, but Grant Hill broke his leg. That off-season, Hill, Hill signed uh, a, a free agent deal along with Tracy McGrady for the, to the Orlando Magic. So that was supposed to be the future of the Orlando Magic. But, you know, um, Grant Hill 
never recovered. I mean, he had surgery on the leg multiple times. He had a staph, uh, staph infection on his leg, which meant that, you know, uh, there was an infection and, and he could have died from that. And um, if you watch uh, NBA uh, holding court, I think the one where all of the, all of the former players sit down in a round table discussion, he actually took out his sock and showed his, how many surgeries he had in his leg. That was all geared towards the desire to play for the magic. Then um, sadly, he could never get healthy enough. He signed with, um, with uh, Phoenix. And one reason why he signed with Phoenix is Phoenix has a very good medical team. You know, they're taking care of Steve Nash, they took care of him and he had resurgence in his career. So my answer, if I was a sports psychologist involved in that, Grant has to make the decision for himself. I know he's pressured by his contract, but he has to think about, you know, about his life after the game of basketball. You know, he's the father of two, uh, two girls, you know, and then he, you know, uh, his family and then, you know, his life after basketball. So that's what I would have advised him there, but you guys need to know the history of what, of what he went through. People are always gonna give him a hard time because he had a big contract and he didn't play, but this is what I mean. We don't see what's happening out, out of the basketball court. There's a lot more stuff happening and what he tried to do to try and play again. You know, he should be credited for that. He should be remembered for that. And he made the Hall of Fame despite having an injured career. So good for Grant. All right. There's, um, what's the challenges of a sports psychologist in the basketball team? Um, well, the biggest challenge is to be hired. That's the biggest <laughs> challenge. The second challenge is if your vision mirrors that of what management wants, mirrors that of what coaches, the coaches want. Because it's only then that, that I would be comfortable to face the players because I, I wouldn't want to be in a situation wherein all the parties see things differently and I'm stuck in the middle and I'm, I may be um, directly or indirectly forced to side with somebody. That's not right. That's not the reason why I'm there. I'm there to help. Last two questions, Ian, and then uh, uh, Bong will ask the last question. Okay, so from, from uh, Carl Angelo Ocampo, um, Doc, does imagery improve sports performance? Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, there's a movie. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember what the movie is. I actually, uh, this is only the second time I, I've, I've talked about this in in, in, uh, in in any setting. The one time I did it, uh, Coach Ariel, you can ask Coach Gilbert Lau. He was there actually mm -hmm. the, last, the first time I, I gave this. And what, the reason why I bring it up is I showed a video, I think in a movie is Drive. Could somebody check online if that's the right movie? It stars uh, Chris Helmsworth as a race car driver. If somebody could check that online, because I don't want to give the wrong information. But anyway, in that movie, Helmsworth was underneath a car, you know, like the car that, you, you know, the engine's out. And then he was, you know, part of my makeshift uh, uh, steering wheel shine. And then he's, he's like tapping on the pedals and tapping on the gears. He's imagining himself. Oh, the movie was Rush. Thanks, mm -hmm. Sandra. The movie was Rush, not Drive. And he was imagining himself on, on the course, turning left, turning right, having to decrease speed, having to increase speed. He was visualizing the course and going through it and ultimately cross, you know, crossing the finish line and seeing that checkered flag. I, I edited that part and I included it as, a, as an example for visualization in my talk. So to answer the question of our participant, it is very important. We should always be powerful. All right. The last question for tonight, Mr. Uh, Eberito. This is the yeah. ulti penultimate question. Yeah, this is the really the penultimate question. So if I was a sports team owner, which I'm not, um, oh, and I'm going <laughs> to ask you, what, 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 uh, why should I hire a sports psychologist for a professional team, be it volleyball, basketball, for a team sports, uh, professional teams team. Uh, why, why should I hire? And uh, how much? much? 
how <laughs> I, I think uh, what are the top three values? Mm. You could quantify it any way you want. Uh, what are the top three things that my team will gain if uh, I have a sports psychologist in my team? So, um, sadly, you know, I'll have you know, you'd have to market what you can possibly get from it, you know? And uh, a lot of sports teams, they may not, they may hi hire because somebody said so, they may not realize why, why they need it. So it's important, you know, to, to see what value you give. And I explained that earlier on. I said, mm -hmm. if your team or your player is a stool and there's three legs, you have your physical base, your spiritual base, your emotional base, uh, your psychological base, and one leg is weak. What what happens when somebody sits on the chair? Falls apart. It falls apart. So, on on that visual alone, why do I, I I'm big on visuals? That that shows you what impact it could possibly have. If even if you don't see it immediately now, mm -hmm. you know if it, it happens in any in any industry. If um. If, if, you're, if the big boss doesn't understand what you're doing, they become highly critical. Why is this person only standing there? Why is this person not doing anything? And half the time, I might be observing, I might be talking to the players when the big boss is not there. You know, um, a lot of things are happening that they may not see. So where, where am I gonna help? During, during the COVID-19, if I was part full-time with the team, I'll probably be the you know second to the coaches and the trainers are probably the most important resource because there might be mental health concerns that the players might need to have addressed. And you know it's a good thing that we have stuff like Zoom to address it, but that's one of the benefits. Um, you you know you 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 want you go around any building. A building can't open if there's no fire extinguishers, if there's no uh, access or hoses. What, why do they have all that stuff there? So not because they're expecting a fire, just so that when it does happen, you're prepared. So having somebody like me, hopefully we can uh, address something because before it becomes too big. That's another, that's another area. And uh, you know, if there's, other, if there's other concerns, like uh, if there's a player that's dealing with an injury, if there's a player that has a concern that falls out of sports psychology, I'm also trained and credentialed in that area. So I can help handle that so that they can address that and go back uh, to their team without having that way on their mind. Now, the other question, uh, I can answer it in three words regarding uh, the cost. Just email me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you guys have a good morning. I didn't beat Coach uh, Tim Cohn's time of three hours, but two and a half hours is uh, good enough. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> again, I would like to personally thank you for your um, uh, session. Uh, of course, um, you've been helping me with the webinars and also yeah. to Ian and uh, Emirito has been uh, um, uh, admin of our uh, uh, Facebook page and uh, you know from um, from starting with two now it, I, I lost count already and uh, thank you very much uh, Doc and uh, for your session also and um, you know uh, for everything that's uh, you've helped uh, my career and my uh, my teams and uh, your uh, that uh, you were part of every team that I've coached uh, so far. Okay. Coach, if there's a war and there's a foxhole, you know I'm right there beside you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, again, thank you so much. And uh, tomorrow is another day for us. We have a 10 a.m. session. Uh, I don't know if Doc is uh, available at that time. <laughs> but uh, there's a big man's coach. Uh, I'm just going to join us at 10 a.m. And then we have a Toyota. Toyota Tabarau's uh, reunion at uh, 3.30, hosted by Rick Olivares and with Phil Sports, Flying V. I hope you can join us for that. And of course, my big boss will be on at 7, uh, Boss Giselle Ducey, and uh, with uh, Matt Bayer of um, uh, the Asia League. 
And after that, the doc's uh, favorite <laughs> session, <laughs> but it's everybody's favorite again. It's uh, our uh, auction for the frontliners. Uh, I hope that uh, you know those that are uh, stayed with us late tonight and our uh, admin here can share to everyone so that uh, we will be able to um, you know uh, uh, raise more. Uh, funds for our dear coaches and you know uh, the stuffs are here with me right now the um, the, the worn see. shirt of Justin Melton signed okay and we got GB Alapag's uh, shirt from Gilas also signed okay and uh, Rashawn McCarthy signed jersey uh, Columbia Jeep okay and I have to ask Mikey the gorgeous uh, permission because this is mine. So he gave it to I, uh, you know, when he when he got traded. So I, you know, I asked for his uniform, but I'm gonna ask his permission if I can. But uh, I want to keep it, okay? So. <laughs> Those are also the two sessions. And the two sessions of Doc Teddy and. The Manny Pacquiao glove. Oh, yeah. Among others. Among others. Among others. There's two, there's some books. Uh, and uh, more to come tomorrow because I'm going to pick up uh, Coach Chots and Coach Josh Reyes uh, stuff. And um, the somebody um, also donated. Uh, again, I'd like to mention that uh, Coach Charles Chu uh, donated. Uh, Three thousand pesos, uh, as uh, you know, as his help uh, uh, for uh, the fund, and uh, you know, we'll go a long way. Go a long way, I'm sure. I've got a list of coaches that reach out, and you know, uh, and uh, I I check also with other uh, coaches that you know, and uh, for sure will be uh, will benefit other coaches who are of course affected by this pandemic and uh, not being able to uh, have a livelihood uh, coaching livelihood because uh, uh, they could they couldn't coach with, with this uh, ECQ and GCQ coming and we don't know what's uh, gonna happen next but let's stay positive okay uh, doc any parting words uh, from yeah. you coach yeah I just like to thank uh, Blackwater who coaches international. Of course, you coach uh, uh, all of our attendees that attended, uh, excluding the international guests, uh, and especially to to my lovely wife Daryl, shout out, and my son Indy, who are, who are uh, listening in and watching as well. All right, shout out to them, and then thank you for allowing us to borrow Teddy for how many uh, hours already, and for your patience and your help. Um, uh, to our dynamic duo, Batman and Robin, uh, Ian and uh, Emerito, I'll see you again tomorrow. And uh, we got lots of work tomorrow because I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be bidding, but I need your help on, you know, <laughs> on the items also. All right. So uh, I've shipped uh, most of the items, but I, you know, I paid... Uh, uh, black water already, so that uh, you know, uh, whatever I receive from the from, uh, the proceeds uh, uh, was already given to them, so that's a clean slate. Then this this new one is a uh, clean slate from the the other one. So I will post the all those that uh, won and all those that donated. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow the artwork will be ready. But uh, again. I'd like to thank all those coaches. I can't name them one by one right now because I might miss uh, someone. But thank you to the coaches and thank you to those who uh, bid it. Also, the winners. Uh, it's uh, you know both are winners and everybody's a winner uh, in here. And then um, I'm just thankful that uh, uh, I'm given this uh, opportunity to be able to help and to be able to uh, be you know, of service to my fellow coaches. Again, uh, any parting words, Ian and Emerito? 
Uh, oh. Thank you, Coach Ariel. Thank you, Coach uh, Dr. Teddy. Thank you, Coach Emerito. Thank all you right. to all of you, and especially today for Dr. Teddy for uh, allowing us to uh, listen to your uh, wisdom today. And also thank you to all our viewers uh, via Zoom and YouTube. Uh, please continue to support Hoop Coaches International and our auctions and fundraisers. All right. Thank you so much uh, for your support again. And again, good morning to everyone. If you can still catch uh, um, Coach Mike Taylor's uh, presentation on another, uh, on the, uh, another uh, webinar uh, he's, that's ongoing right now. Uh, you can check that out. Also, it's on. Uh, I promise him that I'll I'll promote it. So it's on uh, the Coach for Coaches Clinic, International Basketball Coaches Clinic. So it's uh, just Google that. He's on right now. So on, you know, positive coaching, and I'll be uh, listening also. Uh, okay, again. Stay safe. See you again tomorrow at 10 a.m. That's the first time. I Hopefully, I'm awake. I'll, I'll, I'll wake me up if I'm not awake. You are still. But, <laughs> years ago, but uh, that's an interesting topic. Big man's coach. So again, 10, 10, 3.30, 7, and 8 o'clock. Okay? Again, uh, stay safe. God bless, and thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.